Griffin wasn't some kind of saint or princess fresh out of an ivory tower, but she was in uncharted territory, and she was confused. Any woman would have trouble keeping her head around a guy like him, she thought. She was already close to falling in love with Ian, but she would never say it out loud. This marriage might be real or a total sham, but her pride wouldn't let her be vulnerable. She wouldn't let herself get hurt. Ian watched her from across the table with a glimmer of surprise in his eyes. It would never have occurred to him that she might be falling for him this quickly, but he could see that she had already started to rely on him. If there's trust there, love will come, he thought. It made perfect sense to him. He sat down at silverware and looked at her without speaking for a long time. The silence made Madison nervous. She had tried to prepare herself for every scenario, but she had not counted on utter silence. We're in the same boat, Madison, he said finally, and we're the only people in the boat to begin with. What do you think? She felt herself blush, but was too stunned to speak. Ian picked up his knife and fork and began to cut his steak. I gave you a chance to back out of all of this, but you refused, he said. He flashed a smile that was gentle, but not terribly warm. She couldn't look at his face, so she dropped her eyes to the bite of steak on his fork. He reached across the table with it, and she accepted the morsel without thinking. It's all been decided, he continued. We're in it for the long haul now. Westons don't divorce, you see. We take the whole till death thing pretty seriously, he stated. Madison looked at him in a daze. She was having trouble keeping her breathing under control. Each time he spoke, he would feed her a bite from his plate. That's who you are now. You're my wife. You're a Weston. She fell into a kind of trance. He kept talking, but all she heard was that they would never split up and that she was his. Her heart was beating fast in her chest, and she could feel herself acting like a robot. The whole world seemed to drop away until there was only his voice, his movements, and the smile on his face. I think I'm coming down with something. A very serious, terminal illness. And only Dr. Weston has the cure, she thought. The weekend had finally arrived, and the terrace of the Pink Star Hotel was decked out for Kelsey and Luke's engagement party. There was arrangements of champagne roses on every flat surface in sight. The Greenwald family had not given Madison's feelings a second thought, but they had spared no expense for Kelsey. It was their way of making sure everyone knew that the Greenwalds and the Morrises were working together. Kelsey, wearing a pale pink dress to match her roses, stood beside Luke at the doors to the terrace, welcoming their guests. She beamed with happiness until Madison appeared with Ian on her arm. Her eyes hardened slightly. I thought you were mad at me, she said through a brittle smile. But I see you've brought your, um, husband with you. That's, that's good. Ian stole a glance at Madison, but she didn't notice. Kelsey did, though. She grinned at Ian like a shark. Welcome! Everyone here today is a friend of the family, she told him. If they get a little crude, try not to hold it against them, she added. Families, as distinguished as the Westons, tended to keep a low profile, and not many people would recognize them. But news about Madison's surprise marriage was already trending on social media and in the press. Anyone who didn't know who Ian was could make things difficult for him that day. He was heading into a viper's nest. Madison eyed him nervously, but she kept up her calm and elegant demeanor. She hadn't given him much warning, and she wasn't sure she hadn't thought to or didn't care to. Kelsey didn't give her a chance to speak, though. She put her hand on Ian's sleeve and leaned into him. I accidentally leaked the news about you two, she said conspiratorially. I hope you won't be too angry with me. It was just a little slip. She took Ian's hand in both of hers and leaned in closer. Madison really is a good person, no matter what everyone else says. It's all just vicious gossip, and I hope you won't hold it against her. For my sake, she requested pretentiously. Madison's face felt hot as a wave of anger rushed through her. She wanted to strangle her sister. Now, because of her little flip, 
Everyone would wonder why Madison and Ian hadn't thrown their own wedding events. Elsie had just thrust them into the spotlight. Because of her, Madison and Ian were about to become the focus of the party. Madison fought back her rage. She didn't even trust herself to speak. Chelsea had always been an excellent actor, but her real gift was for making herself look pitiful, so that Madison always came across as a monster. She didn't know if Ian would buy Kelsey's innocent act, but getting into a fight wouldn't help her case. She had spent years being manipulated by her baby sister. She turned to brush an imaginary piece of lint from Ian's jacket and gently pulled him away from Kelsey. I know he's gorgeous, Kelsey. But you shouldn't really be pawing at another man while your fiancé is standing right next to you, she said, her voice oozing with mock sincerity. I mean, what will people say? You wouldn't want to make the Greenwalds the topic of even more gossip. Kelsey froze. Her eyes darted around the terrace, and she saw that people were staring. She pulled her hand back as if she had been burned and stepped closer to Luke, never even noticing the slight frown on his face. She cursed inwardly. Her father would never let her hear the end of it if she embarrassed the family. Sorry, she said. I didn't mean to make you uncomfortable. Ian nodded slightly and led Madison into the party. She could already hear people talking about them. I hear the family dropped her. She's supposed to be married or getting married, but there hasn't been an announcement or anything. One of them murmured. Maybe it's a shotgun wedding situation? She must have trapped him or something. I give it a year, top. Another one stated. He's supposed to be a doctor at Mercy Hospital, isn't he? That's something, at least. It means he's not a total nobody. He picked a good family to marry into, even if he picked the wrong daughter. A third one remarked. They probably married her off to avoid a bigger scandal. You know what they say about her, someone said. Ian reached for Madison's hand and gave it a comforting squeeze. He was trying to let her know that he didn't take them or their gossip seriously. I hear you're a doctor, one of the guests said to Ian. At Mercy, right? Your specialty, he leered at Madison. Family planning? A titter of cruel laughter spread around them. Madison felt her face burn again. That's what they think of me. I'm just some tramp trying to snag any man who'll stand still long enough, she thought. She had heard the rumors before, but never directly to her face. Normally, she didn't pay them any attention. But it was different with Ian beside her. It was humiliating for her, but she could only imagine what he must think. She took a deep breath and looked up at him. Is this the moment? Is this when I decide enough is enough? She wondered. She had never known why people said the things they did about her. They seemed intent on making her life miserable, and now they were dragging Ian into it. She was through letting it happen. She took another deep breath and looked at the man who had just spoken, eyes bright with unshed tears. The laughter died away uneasily. No one had ever seen her show this kind of emotion. I don't know you, Madison said, her voice low and sad. I don't know where you've heard these things about me, but I'm not... They're not true. She looked around her. No one could meet her eyes. They came out of nowhere. I'm begging you to tell me who's saying these things. What have I done to deserve any of this? Her eyes shone, but her tears didn't fall. She was heartbreaking. Madison and Kelsey didn't look much alike. They both favored their mother. Kelsey had a very girl-next-door quality, while Madison had stronger features. Those strong features were twisted with pain as she pleaded, winning the crowd's sympathy. I lost my mom when I was just a kid. I was raised by my brother and my stepmother, and I will remember their kindness for the rest of my life. I don't know why anyone thinks it matters to me that Kelsey got engaged before I did. It doesn't, she continued. She was more certain than ever that she wanted to remain in Ian's family. But the rumors about her needed to end. The Westons might not care about cruel gossip, but she did. My family has always taken care of me, and I'm here for them and my sister. 
Who don't know what kind of person would actually spew this garbage at her engagement party? Today isn't about me. So why would you want to ruin her special night by driving a wedge between us? Madison expressed. She let the silence wash over her audience. All they saw now was a motherless little girl. She had dutifully praised Stella, but she also knew how people felt about stepmothers who marry into wealthy families. Madison had cast a shadow of doubt over her bad reputation. She could see a few people nodding unconsciously. I have watched Kelsey plan people's sympathy for years, she thought in cold triumph. Looks like I managed to pick up a few of her tricks. Ian lowered his eyes to meet hers. He had only known her for a few days, but he could see that he had been right about her. He could tell that she was putting on a show. But even he was moved by her performance. He squeezed her hand again. I know I'm not perfect, but I'm doing my best. I'm not a competitive person, so it was hard for me to decide to go to college. But I thought I could get a degree, and then I'd be able to pay back some of the kindness my family has shown me. I don't know where my reputation came from, but I'm done pretending I don't care. Of course I care, how could I not? I just don't know what I did to make people hate me enough to... She called out. She let her voice trail off for effect. Almost everything she said was true, which was why it was so effective. It was also hard to dispute unless Stella or Kelsey stood up and proudly declared that they had treated her like trash for years. Madison often let her feelings overwhelm her reason, but she wasn't some shy little mouse. She would have never survived in the Greenwald family if she had been. Not everyone listening was sympathetic, in the corner of her eye, she caught a couple of women frowning at her. They looked as if they were about to speak, but neither of them did. She knew their type. They were trophy wives whose main interests were spending money and spreading gossip. Madison had been such a rich vein of the latter for a long time, but now the game was ruined. She had struck the perfect balance of wounded child and loyal daughter and sister. It was harder than ever to square the thoughtless hussy with the pained, elegant woman standing before them. The rumors about her started to seem fishy in the light of day. A woman stepped forward and gently touched Madison's shoulder. Don't you listen to a thing these mean old snakes say, she said. It's all just idle chatter. You've found yourself a good, kind man, and he's easy in the eyes, so who cares what people say about you? There was a mild buzz of agreement as people rewrote history in their heads. And he's a doctor. That's impressive, no matter what his specialty, someone said. She's a strong young woman. Half the girls coming up these days would fight their sisters to the death before letting them get married first. She's got a good head on her shoulders, another guest audibly piped in. As the room's tone began to shift, Ian smiled almost imperceptibly. He had not expected such a powerful speech, but he knew that almost everything she said was true. She had suffered greatly under her family, and she had been almost entirely alone the whole time. He was surprised to find that his own heart ached for her. He slid his arm around her and hugged her close. She looked around the party, her eyes red, and stubbornly refused to let her tears fall. She wasn't ready to let go of them. There was more she needed to get done. Thank you, she said with a weak smile. Thank you for believing me. She decided it was time to lay it on a little thicker. I honestly didn't think you would, knowing what people have been saying about me. I'm just a student. My life is really boring. I don't even know what floor of the hospital the family planning office is located on. She elaborated. Madison finally allowed the tears to fall from her eyes, letting them stream down her face. The party goers now saw a pitiful girl who had grown up without her birth mother, and their protective urges did the rest. More than a few people wondered how those vicious rumors could have started. Who would say such awful things about such a sweet young lady? The tears of a motherless child, humiliated by scandal, who loyally stood by her sister, a sister who got a lavish engagement party instead of her, washed away the last of the whispers. She stood before them as a symbol of strength and grace, whereas... Up until a few moments ago, she had been known as a disgraceful wild child. The Greenwald name is well known, 
but I'm just an ordinary college kid, she went on with a bitter little chuckle, her cheeks streaked with tears. The men that I've been accused of, well, I barely even met them. If anything like that had, if I had done the things people have said I've done, then I probably would have married a lot sooner, she announced. There was more nodding now. The rumors about her had been entertaining and very mean, but no one had thought too deeply about them or what they meant. No one could seem to explain how they could have ever believed that a young lady, one seemingly overshadowed by her younger sister, would even have access to the powerful men she'd been accused of seducing, especially someone like Madison, who had never been shy about doing what she wanted. It didn't make sense that someone as public as Madison can be just as public about her love life. Ian was watching her closely, but Madison couldn't read the expression on his face. She had won. By tomorrow morning, the only thing they'll say about you is that you're strong, smart, and kind. And you've managed to make it seem like your family stood by and let all this happen to you without directly calling them out, he thought, impressed. It had been some very skillful public relations work. She had even smoothed away any possible objections his own family might have as a result of her reputation. Who are you, Madison? Ian mused as he watched her audience drift away from the scene and get back to the party. She had proven that she knew how to deflect or subvert the expectations of others when she had won over his grandmother. When confronted by her, he remembered that Madison hadn't denied the rumors, but instead had asked Diana a pointed question of her own. She was wily and stunning. Ian was forced to admit that he was intrigued by her. With the performance well and truly over, Madison took a deep breath and let the forlorn waves look drop. He felt uncomfortable with how well it had gone. She'd watched Kelsey play pretend with people for a long time, but only now was she able to admire her for it. She started to move with the crowd toward the tables where dinner was about to be served, but Ian held her close. His hand had snaked across her waist, and he exerted the tiniest bit of pressure on her hip. She raised her eyes to his, confused and a little nervous. She wondered if he had been put off by her little speech. Can you see that I didn't have a choice? We're never going to be a real couple to those people until there's a wedding reception. And the only way to make sure that we get a celebration is to put my bad reputation to rest. Madison mumbled in her head. She had never cared much about what people thought of her. But the stories about her could end up preventing the Westons from fully accepting her. She had needed the rumors dealt with, and they had been. This is who I am, Madison said to Ian, her eyes sparkling, having second thoughts. She was telling the truth. She knew not everyone was kind, and she had learned to be distrustful. If pretending to be the type of person she loathed would keep her safe, she would do it. She would even marry a man she had only seen twice. She'd never been a timid little rabbit. She was a wolf that hid her fangs. Ian stared down at her. He pulled his arm from her waist and shoved his hands into his pockets. Startled, she lowered her eyes and went perfectly still. Look at me, he said, his voice low but firm. She took a deep breath and met his gaze. He watched her emotions flicker and dance in her eyes. What he did not see, though, was a trace of shyness. What I need you to remember is that you are my wife, he growled. I'm your husband. No one will hurt you when I'm with you. Any attack on you is an attack on me, Ian stated. Her eyes widened. It was the first time he had ever said anything like that to her. She groped for a response but he didn't give her a chance to speak. Don't try to get inside my head, he went on, his deep, mellow voice ringing in her ears. I don't like it. He took her hand and led her toward the center of the party without waiting for a response. He didn't seem interested in what she thought about his declaration. The kindness and gentleness that served him as a doctor were harder for him to draw upon as a husband. Her distrust toward him had exhausted his goodwill. There were tables with little place cards arranged in the center of the terrace. 
Ian guided them to a large trestle table on a raised platform for the wedding party and their families. There was an empty seat beside hers for her brother, Zach. She wasn't the only person who had noticed it. She was surrounded by more whispers, which Ian ignored. She strained to catch snippets of the conversations floating around her. Word had spread that he was supposed to be returning for the engagement party, and people were wondering if it was true. Zach was the kind of person everyone wanted to impress. Madison had watched people tie themselves in knots for his approval. Her brother had left the country at the age of 25 and had not been home since. He was the only Greenwald people talked about more than her. I bet half the people here only showed up because they thought he'd come, she mused. She hoped he would be there too. He was the only person in her family who had ever made her feel loved. She could feel people staring at her from every corner of the terrace and lowered her head. Ian sat beside her, as still as a statue, ignoring all the chatter about Zack. At the center of the table, Kelsey and Luke rose to their feet, and the murmurs died away. Kelsey held Luke's hand and giggled shyly. Despite herself, Madison found herself smiling warmly at them. Ian caught her expression and raised his eyebrows in surprise. Kelsey looked around at all her guests and felt a wave of pride. Her smile faltered when she saw Madison and Ian. She picked up the microphone that had been set on the table and stood to address the party. Luke and I want to thank you all for taking time from your busy schedules to celebrate with us. I think it's all a lot of fuss for little old me, personally. I would have been happy with a simple ceremony in our backyard. But when a Greenwald marries a Morris, everyone expects a gala, she announced. Madison toyed with her hair to hide her embarrassment, while polite laughter rippled across the terrace. She knows how to work a crowd, she thought. Kelsey knew how to be adorably charming on command. It was easy to dote on her, especially when she played up her awestruck bride routine. Her guests were eating it up. Not that I'm not grateful for all this, she said as if to cover a blunder. But I'm the baby sister. All this is more than I deserve. I'm just happy I get to marry Luke. She turned to him and smiled as he blushed. You really are the best man I know, and I can't wait to be your wife. The crowd practically swooned. She had skillfully praised her family and her intentions while making herself seem simple, gentle, and kind. It was a masterful performance. Kelsey nodded at Luke and handed him the microphone. He was about to speak when Madison and Ian caught his eye, and he faltered, distracted. Madison, Ian said. She looked at him blankly, puzzled. He smiled and tucked a lock of her hair behind her ear. It was a tender, intimate gesture in a very public setting. Madison blinked, unable to speak. He was so close to her, and his smile was so bright she felt dizzy. Am I swooning? Is this some kind of trick only beautiful men know? She wondered. Marrying him had been a means to avoid getting stuck with Drake. But she knew there was more to it than just that. Ian had a hold on her that she couldn't explain. All he had to do was stand there and she was helpless. She would follow him anywhere. He watched her with amusement. His grin grew broader and he turned to look at Luke with a glint of challenge in his eyes. The happy smile on Luke's face faded into a scowl as he tightened his grip on the microphone. There was a long, uncomfortable silence as Luke simply stared at them. Kelsey followed his gaze and narrowed her eyes. Of course, Madison, again. She can't even let me have this one day, she seized. Her face burning, she pretended not to notice her fiancé staring at Madison in a daze. She elbowed him sharply. Honey, don't be nervous she said, making sure the microphone picked up her voice. Does my brother-in-law have your speech written on his forehead? There was a little wave of confused laughter as everyone turned to look at Ian. Anyone who hadn't known about their marriage sure knew now. Madison sighed and tried to ignore the looks they were getting, which ranged from sympathetic to gleefully mocking. She remembered what Ian had said earlier and tried to let it go. Their gossip didn't hurt her with him by her side. The Westons didn't take the gossip seriously, so neither should she. Her outward calm was portrayed by her clenched fist in her lap. Ian's warm hands covered hers, lending her strength. She felt her heartbeat slow down, 
and the corner of her mouth twitched into a smile, but she didn't turn to look at him. Luke cleared his throat, and the moment passed. Sorry, everyone, he stammered. I guess I am a little nervous. Not just about the speech, though. Kelsey is so sweet and so nice. I'm nervous about being good enough for her. Lucky for me, though, I have a future brother-in-law right here to help me out. He held for the obligatory chuckle while Madison and Ian listened with blank faces. He was about to resume his speech when there was a sudden commotion from the entrance on the terrace. Luke and Kelsey stared at the doors with their jaws hanging open. Before she could look up, a shadow fell over Madison. When she saw who was standing in front of her, her face lit up. Ian had never seen her smile so brightly. Zack! One word, like a stone tossed into a calm water, caused a ripple that spread throughout the terrace. Zack had been a rising star in town, both socially and professionally. Then, at 25, he had chosen to leave the city and disappeared for five years. He stood looking down at Madison with a smile. Hey, Mads, I'm back, Zack announced. John and Stella rushed over from their seats to embrace Zack. There was so much noise and movement that everyone seemed to have forgotten about the happy couple. Madison stood up and scurried around the table to throw herself into her brother's arms with a happy squeal. Ian took in Zack's return with narrowed eyes. He watched everyone greeting him for a few minutes before rising to his feet and moving to stand by Madison. Your teacher is still standing out there, he reminded her. His voice was low, but it was powerful enough to carry. Everyone seemed to realize why they were there and awkwardly shuffled back to their seats, pretending nothing was amiss. Kelsey glared at Madison but said nothing. I'll make sure you pay for this, she thought bitterly. Zack or no Zack, I'll make sure you're nothing to this family. She swallowed her emotions as everyone settled back into their seats. Luke couldn't keep the scowl off his face after Zack had stolen the limelight, although there was nothing he could do. Zack was one of the most highly regarded young men in high society circles, on par with Daniel Weston, the son of the renowned Weston family. In fact, the two were friends, and they were considered untouchable. As the commotion died down, Madison turned to her brother. Why didn't you tell me you were back? I would have come to pick you up. No matter how much time had passed, she and her brother would always have a special bond. Zack smiled at her, but he didn't say anything. Since you left, things have been miserable, she whispered. No one in that house wants to eat pizza at three in the morning with me. How long are you staying? Zack laughed and shook his head. I just got back, and you're already trying to get rid of me? He joked. I'm trying to get rid of you, she said. I don't want you to leave at all. When you left, I think a part of me left with you. Madison had completely forgotten where she was and who she was with. She spent the rest of the dinner catching up with Zack until John came over and ferried him away. It was only then that she realized how quiet Ian had been. She would have given it more thought, but she was still buzzing from the excitement of seeing her big brother again. She told Ian all about Zack at a small table at a corner of the terrace as the party died down. I can't believe I forgot to introduce you to him, she said. I was just so surprised to see him. You'll love him. He's the best. He's got an MBA from Rice and a PhD in economics from Oxford, and he's the only person in the entire family who didn't make me feel like an outsider all the... Ian interrupted her by pulling her close and kissing her. She felt her knees weaken and could only grab his shirt. Her heart thudded in her chest, and she forgot how to breathe. She had a moment to wonder what was happening before she closed her eyes and lost herself in his kiss. He kissed her for a very long time. When they finally came up for air, he gently let her go and looked deep into her eyes. You talk too much, Madison, he whispered. Her jaw dropped. She was too angry to speak. What the hell kind of... What do you think... You... One of us. She couldn't even think straight. She was still quivering with anger when he hugged her, his own thoughts spinning out of control. He was jealous. He was upset that she had forgotten he was there. 
He was upset that there was someone in her life closer than him. He was upset that he was upset about it. It was the first time he had lost control like that. He was most upset about that. I don't even recognize myself when I'm with you. This isn't like me. I don't get jealous. And why would I be jealous of your brother? He thought. Ian wanted to leave. He wanted to be away from the party and the noise. But he didn't want to be away from her. They stood without speaking for a moment. They couldn't even look at each other. She was too angry, and he was too confused. He coughed awkwardly, and the spell that held them in place broke. She turned on her heel and walked away without saying a word. He cursed under his breath and chased after her. Let's talk about this, please, he said, gently taking her hand. She didn't say anything, but she stopped walking. Madison, please, at least let me take you somewhere you can yell at me without giving these vultures more to gossip about. She nodded, but still said nothing. I knew he really didn't love me. How could he? He doesn't even really know me. I don't even know if he likes me. I'm not sure if I like him. I'm not sure about anything. Madison scolded him in her head. She did not want to say a word to him while they left the hotel, or when the valet brought the car around. She stared out the window as he drove, lost in thought. He had told her once that their marriage was neither a game nor a sham to him, that he really wanted to marry her. Everything had happened so fast that she hadn't had a moment to think. But after that kiss, she was having doubts. She wondered if she had traded one unhappy future for another. Ian had been a convenient way to avoid having to marry Drake. But did she really want to be with him? She shook her head. At the very least, I should be with someone who cares about me. I deserve that much. If Ian can't manage that, we can't be together, she thought. The car pulled up in front of the Weston's house, but she made no move to open the door. Ian shut off the engine and waited quietly. He was annoyed by his own reckless behavior. He had never been the kind of person who acts without thinking. But since meeting Madison, that seemed to be the only way he could act. He was worried that the closer he got to her, the more impulsive he would become. So let's talk, she said. She looked straight ahead, and her voice was low and tense. Ian nodded. Neither spoke for a full minute. I don't know why you agreed to marry me, Ian, but she made it pretty clear that if we went through with it, divorce would never be a possibility unless we broke your family's rules. So that means I'll always be your wife unless we try to kill each other or something? She stated. Yes. Ian nodded again. Okay. If we're going to live together, I have some conditions. She fought to keep her nervousness out of her voice. She thought she was just starting to see what he was really like, and she was worried about what she saw. Her self-respect demanded that she take a stand. He might never love her, but she refused to stop loving herself. Ian's hands tightened on the steering wheel. Conditions? I know all about the conditions. I thought that Madison would be different, he thought bitterly. So many women in his life had been more interested in his family and their money than in him. He had even been about to propose once, but she left him. He had been strung along by very patient women with conditions more than once. He was glad, suddenly, that she couldn't look at him. That way, she wouldn't see his face grow colder and colder. He had been down this road before, so he said nothing. He just waited for her to finish before showing him who she really was. Madison took his silence for a scent. She swallowed the lump in her throat. There was steel in her voice when she spoke. If we're going to do this, if we're going to make this work, the thing I need, the very minimum, is your respect. She let out a shaky breath. I don't know what kind of person you think I am. For all I know, you believe everything people say about me. Or maybe you don't. Either way, I need you to see me. The real me. The woman who proposed to you on the street to avoid being forced to marry someone my parents picked for me. She expressed. Ian turned to face her, but he didn't interrupt. He studied her profile in the fading light and was struck by how beautiful she was. He knew that every word she had just said would stay with him forever, as it had been etched into his heart. After the incident at the party, Madison wanted to make a few things clear to Ian. Sitting in the car, Madison confronted Ian and expressed that she expects respect in the relationship they share. 
A divorce wouldn't bother me, she said. If I'm being honest, I think I expected one as soon as my family dropped the whole idea of marrying me off like some aristocrat's daughter. What I didn't expect, though, was that I'd meet you. She paused, hoping it was dark enough that he couldn't see her blush. The notes of helplessness and hope she heard in her voice embarrassed her. You know what my family's like. If your family will have me, then I'll stay with you. But if they object, I won't hold you to it. I know they won't force you to drop me, but you can. I'm giving you that option, she concluded. Madison's mother had died when she was very young, and aside from her brother, she had never had anyone she could rely on. She had learned very early that the only person who would ever protect her was herself. Even Ian wouldn't be able to convince her otherwise. She turned to face him. They looked directly into each other's eyes. That's it. That's all I need from you. But until there's something real between us, something true, don't touch me. I won't be pressured into... You know, she said. Ian didn't speak for a long while. Neither of them did. They just looked at each other. He was struggling to understand his feelings. He honestly couldn't tell whether Madison was giving him too much credit, or if he had profoundly underestimated her, or both. He had expected her to make demands in the form of real estate or travel allowances, but she really didn't want a thing from him, or his family, but his respect. He broke the heavy silence in the car. Anything else? he asked. Her eyes narrowed. I'm still in school. If there's going to be a wedding celebration, it'll have to wait until after I graduate. It's less than a month. Deal? she requested. His face broke into a slow smile. There was a gleam in his eyes. She stared back at him, waiting for an answer. Deal, he said. And I promise you, until it's real between us, I won't lay a finger on you, he replied. Neither noticed that he used the words until. Something had changed between them. Something that made them both regret the word if. Years later, when they would reflect on their lives, they would remember this moment as a turning point. It would be the moment that made them believe in destiny. Madison heaved a sigh of relief. Her entire posture changed as she let go of the anxiety she had been holding on to since he had kissed her. Ian couldn't wipe the smile from his face, so he gazed out his window and marveled at how beautiful the world was. The trill of Madison's cell phone startled them both. She glanced at the screen and grinned. It's Zach, she said, not noticing that Ian's smile faded. She barely had time to speak when she answered the call. Madison, you need to come home right now, he said. I'll wait for you. He ended the call before she could respond. The anger in his voice caused a flutter of fear in her chest. She had never heard him sound so tense. She stared at the phone in confused panic. Ignoring the phone call entirely, Ian had already unbuckled his seatbelt and opened the door to get out of the car. We'd better get inside, he said blithely. We've been sitting out here for a while, and my grandmother's probably waiting for us. It's been a couple of days since she's seen you, so she's likely to start bugging your parents if we don't show our faces, he informed. He had hoped to distract her from whatever the call had been about, but he underestimated Madison's bond with her brother. Her perfect champion, he thought. All his irrational jealousy and anger rushing through him again. She grabbed his arm, keeping him in the car. Can you take me home? She asked anxiously. Let your grandmother know I'll come by tomorrow to explain, but I really need you to take me home. Her mind spun with worry about her brother. He had only just come back, so she couldn't imagine what might have happened to make him so angry. Please, she pleaded. She watched his eyes grow cold. Shaking her hand off his arm, he climbed out of the car and slammed the door shut without saying a word. He didn't even look back at her as he strode toward the front steps of his family home. Madison sat there for a moment in stunned silence before getting out of the car herself. She was torn for a moment, but she knew it wasn't even a question. Zack was the most important person in the world to her. He was more than her brother. He was her protector. After taking a last look at Ian, she turned and ran in the opposite direction. Overwhelmed by anger, confusion, and betrayal, Madison ran down the long driveway toward the main road. The Weston's home was located midway up a hillside, 
along with five or six other large homes. The neighborhood was close enough to the city for an easy commute, but far from the noise and crowds of city life. She knew she couldn't make it home on foot, but she needed to be as far from Ian as possible. She had only made it a few steps before realizing that heels were not ideal for running on uneven terrain in the dark. She kicked off her shoes and kept running until she reached the graceful open archway that marked the end of the long driveway. Catching her breath, she ordered a car from her phone and waited while she fought back her tears. Ian had stopped walking toward the house when he heard Madison open her door and was waiting for her to catch up to him when he realized that her footsteps were leading away from him. He turned to catch a glimpse of her running into the night. A fresh surge of anger roared through him, its intensity taking him by surprise. He hadn't felt anything like it since his childhood. With gritted teeth, he turned back and stomped into the house, slamming the door behind him. After a brief and comfortable ride home, Madison thanked her driver, who was clearly terrified of her, and ran into the house. Not stopping to greet John and Stella, she headed straight up the stairs to her room. She skidded to a stop outside the open door and tried to slow down her thudding heart. I'm either hyperventilating or I'm seriously out of shape, she thought. Zach stood at the window across the room, dressed in a plain white t-shirt and jeans. His back was to her, and his posture was rigid. Even from across the room, she could feel the anger radiating from his skin like a fever. Her anxiety rose even more as she tried to control her breathing. Zach, she said, her voice hoarse. He took a deep breath, clearly trying his best to suppress his outrage. He turned to her, ready for a fight. But he could only sigh when he saw the state she was in. She was sweating and bedraggled, and her dress was torn and filthy. Her hair was a wild tangle, and her eyes were red. She held her shoes in one hand, and he looked down at her shredded hose and saw the cuts and scratches on her feet. She looked like she had escaped the battle zone. He didn't speak, so she could only watch his face carefully and wait. She could see the concern for her in his eyes, along with his anger. Get cleaned up, he said. We'll talk when you're done. He walked past her, patting her shoulder gently as he left the room. She nodded and closed the door behind him. After a quick shower, she was putting her hair up when she heard a tap at her door. Zach walked in and sat at her desk, frowning at her. I'm taking you to the county courthouse tomorrow, and you're going to start divorce proceedings. Madison's eyes widened in surprise. What? Why? She had to admit that she wasn't certain how to deal with Ian, but she wanted it to be her decision. Whether she liked it or not, he had taken up a corner of her heart, and a divorce was not as a simple solution as it sounded. Zach's eyes narrowed. The guy you've been telling me about for four years is not Ian Weston, Mads, he said. Do you really think I'd let you marry some guy you don't even know, even if it's Ian? She bit her lip nervously. Aside from her father, no one in the family argued with Zach. He was used to getting his way, and he never bothered to explain himself. And besides... He's already given me a reason, she thought miserably, and he hadn't given her an opportunity to refuse. Zack sat at the desk with a serious look on his face. Madison's breath quickened, and her hands balled into fists as he looked at him. Neither of them said anything for a long time. Then he stood up, and walked over to her. He stroked her hair softly and said, Listen to me. I'm not going to hurt you. He walked past her and made his way toward the door. She closed her eyes tightly, listening to his footsteps. For the first time in her life, she was going against her brother. I won't divorce him, she replied stubbornly. Her voice was firm and resolute, and the sound of footsteps ceased. The room was uncomfortably quiet. Madison took a deep breath and mustered all her courage. She turned around to look at him, afraid he hadn't heard her properly. She repeated, I won't divorce Ian. She could see his body stiffen and his eyes fill with anger. She could feel a storm coming and took a step back. We just got married, 
I can't just turn around and divorce him. I know that you're surprised by everything that's happened, but I really don't want to, she said. Madison, Zack said, his voice low with suppressed anger. He turned around slowly and looked her straight in the eyes. Do you know who he is? He asked. She wasn't angry that he had interrupted her. She stared right back at him. Two seconds of silence passed between them, and she nodded. I do. I also know what I'm doing. Zack put his hand in his pocket and eased up a little. However, she could still see the tension in the way he was standing. Without thinking too much about it, she said, I know it looks strange. You know that Ian isn't the man I've been dating for the past four years, and I'm sure you already know who he truly is. She took a small step forward, but still maintained a safe distance. Anxiously, she continued, I'm sure you can understand why I made my decision. Zack looked at her. She still looked like the young and reserved sister he remembered. There was no makeup on her face, showing how modest she was. The news of her marriage had made him angry as soon as it had reached him. But behind the anger, there was a deep heartache for his little sister. She must have had a terrible life these past five years, he thought. Madison noticed his expression had eased a little, and she boldly took a step forward. She reached out and pulled at his sleeve, just as she used to do as a little child. Back then, she'd always followed him around happily, pulling at his sleeve and making his heart ache. Ian looked down at her and sighed. No matter how much anger he had inside him, seeing her like this made it almost completely disappear. Back, she said softly, her voice full of grievance. In the five years that he had been away, she had gone through a lot of things with the Greenwald family and she had learned many ways of getting by without his protection. He had been the one to shield her from the dangers of the world, and she hadn't had anyone to lean on while he had been overseas. She had been elated when she found out that he was back. He was her knight in shining armor who always protected her. With reddened eyes, she asked him, Why didn't you come back earlier? If you had, I wouldn't have been so scared. Tears began to fall down her cheeks as she spoke. She didn't dare imagine what would have happened between her and Drake if she hadn't come to her senses at the birthday party. The thought of what her life would be like had she not overheard the conversation between Stella and Kelsey that night terrified her. And if she hadn't met Ian and had married another man. Zack frowned. He'd never thought his departure would bring on so much suffering for her. He knew what she was like. She wouldn't have come asking him for help if it wasn't a matter of life and death. Madison stopped crying and wiped away her tears. She looked at him with watery eyes and said firmly once again, I won't divorce him. If I did, then our family would force me to marry Drake. And even you couldn't protect me then. Zack didn't say anything. It was true that he couldn't even help her now, as John was determined to chase her out of the family. There was nothing he could do about that. She would have to leave, no matter what. Madison knew that he agreed with her, and her expression relaxed. She smiled and adopted the tone of a spoiled child to try and lighten the mood. You're not leaving again, right? She asked, eyeing him anxiously. While he was still around, she felt like she had someone there to help her if she needed it. You'll stay to work at Silverwood, right? Silverwood was a corporation belonging to the Greenwalds, destined to fall into the hands of the family's children. Can't you start a family here? I would love that. Maybe I could have a sister-in-law soon, she said with a satisfied smile. She didn't give him a chance to answer, already having decided for him with her happiness. Zack smiled at her and nodded, letting out a sigh. Then he closed the distance between them, and the two of them chatted casually. They seemed to have forgotten all the unhappiness they had just felt. They talked for a long time before Zack got up and left Madison's room. He told her that he would go and see Ian someday, and asked her to prepare for this. She didn't fully come back to her senses until Zack had left the room. Ian, she thought suddenly. She seemed to have forgotten about him. She remembered how she had stood Diana up and began to worry. Then she thought of Ian's dark expression and a sense of hopelessness immediately settled over her. She ran over to lock the door and lay on her bed, 
She took out her phone and checked if she had any unread messages or unanswered calls. However, Ian had not tried to make contact by any means, and she could feel herself begin to panic. Is he angry with me? Madison wondered. She looked at the time and saw that it was already ten o'clock. She hesitated for a moment, but still decided to give Ian a call. The dial tone sounded for a long time. When she was about to give up, he finally picked up. What's the matter? he asked, not even greeting her. He's angry, she thought, her stomach nodding up. I... she began. She didn't know what to say. Her grip tightened around her blanket, and she listened to Ian's breathing on the other side of the line. Finally, she asked, Are you angry? She wanted to slap herself. Are you stupid? You can't just ask him that, she thought to herself. Ian snorted, and the cold laugh made Madison shiver. I'm a doctor. I can't bring my emotions to work, he responded. From his tone, she couldn't decipher whether he was angry or not. She had been almost certain about it when he had first picked up, but now she wasn't so sure. He continued, I'm on duty right now. If there's something you need to tell me, do it now. You're still at work? Surprised, she asked. Ian didn't feel like talking to her at that moment, and he wanted to hang up. However, she started firing questions at him. How long have you been at work? Have you eaten? Are you busy? Ian answered each one of them tersely in order. Since seven, no I haven't, yes I am. Now she was worried about him. Aren't you hungry? she asked. Can't you eat something? You should go find something to eat right now. What do you want, Madison? I'm very busy right now. Ian interrupted her impatiently. She faltered, upset by his reaction. Softly, she said, Nothing. I just wanted to check in on you. Are you angry at me? Her feelings were completely exposed to him. There was an uncomfortable silence at the other end that made her nervous. Just when she thought that he had hung up, he suddenly spoke, Yes, I'm angry. He told her once more that he was busy and hung up. She held the phone in her hand, wondering what to do. His words rang through her head again and again. He's angry. What did I do? She thought worriedly. Madison sat on the bed, thinking. After a while, she got up and went to the kitchen, having made up her mind. She took out of the fridge the sandwich and soup she had made for lunch the next day and packed them into a container and a thermos. She placed them in her bag and went back upstairs to change. After that, she headed out. Mercy was the most highly regarded hospital in the city, and its surgical department was famous worldwide. When Madison got out of the taxi and looked at the brightly lit building, she contemplated turning around and leaving. She stood there at the entrance, unsure of what to do. It was so late, and Ian had told her that he was busy. Will he be upset with me if I turn up like this? She wondered. She looked upwards in the direction of the 17th floor. She had originally thought she would try to coax him, as he was angry, but now she wondered if she might make him even angrier. Will he divorce me? Is he angry enough to violate the Weston family code? She thought. She slowly walked toward the hospital. When she entered, she caught sight of the emergency room. Doctors and nurses were walking around briskly, tending to patients, all of them very busy. Car accidents are always ugly, one of the nurses said to another. The other nodded. People really need to watch out on the road. Madison listened to the people talking around her and discovered that there had been a car accident near Mercy Hospital, and most of the patients had been brought over there. Hence, the hospital was very busy, even as it drew close to midnight. She stood to the side and watched blankly. There were patients covered in blood on gurneys, and she could hear their pained groans. Suddenly, she caught sight of Ian walking among them. He bent down over a man with a badly injured arm, his expression serious. He turned around and said something to the nurse, who nodded and paid more attention to the patient's condition. This was the first time Madison had seen Ian at work, 
and it shocked her. Ian was a member of the Weston family. He was her husband, who protected her from her own family. He was the head of the surgical department and was held in high regard and praised by everyone at the hospital. But now that she saw him like this, so serious and professional looking, saving people's lives right before her eyes, she suddenly viewed him in a new light. Her grip on her bag tightened, and she remembered that he hadn't eaten yet. However, she also knew that she couldn't disturb him just then. Madison turned around and headed to the elevator. Ian was so focused on the patients that he hadn't noticed she was there. However, she would remember him like this forever. I will take care of you, she promised him in her mind. She didn't know where the thought had come from. When the elevator doors closed, she lowered her head and smiled. Madison walked the path to Ian's office confidently. Although she knew he wasn't inside, she knocked on the door before entering. Once in the empty office, she set the containers on his desk, filling the room with the smell of food and bringing some home-like warmth to the cold and indifferent surroundings. She sat down on one of the chairs and quietly waited for Ian to arrive. She didn't know when he would be coming, but she wanted to see him before she left. She waited for a long time, but when he still hadn't appeared by two in the morning, Madison got up and prepared to head home. She didn't know where the microwave was, so she left the food on the table and wrote Ian a note, hoping he would read it and eat something. When Madison stepped out the door, she bumped into Dr. Faltus, who was just outside in the corridor. Sorry, she apologized by reflex. Although she wore a clean white gown, Vivian Faltus still smelled like blood. She probably just came from the operating room, Madison thought. She wondered if this meant that Ian would come back soon, too. Dr. Faltus looked at her, and a strange expression flashed across her face. She shook her head to indicate that Madison didn't need to apologize. She was actually surprised that Madison had said anything to her. The doctor could see that she had been waiting at the office for a long time. She smiled and said, Ian's just finished surgery and is preparing for another operation. It'll be at least three or four hours before he's finished. Is there anything I can do for you? Madison was a little disappointed when she heard this. She shook her head and thanked Dr. Faltus with a smile. Then she turned around and left. She didn't notice the woman open the door to the office and go in as she walked away. Ian had just finished an amputation and was exhausted. In addition to his lack of rest, he hadn't eaten anything that day. He wrapped up and dragged his tired body back to the office. As soon as he opened the door, he frowned. He had never liked foreign smells in his office, and there were two of them present right now. One was a very familiar perfume, and the other was the smell of some sort of food. Dr. Fultus had already changed. She now wore a tight dress that outlined her figure, and she was standing by his desk fiddling with something. She looked unhappy. Do you need something? he asked, looking away from her and walking over to the desk. Not even the food on the table interested him. If there's nothing else, you can go. I'm very tired. He wanted her to leave, but she didn't seem to get the hint. Shyly, she said, I brought a couple of sandwiches and soup for myself today, and I thought you might want some. I know how busy you are. His eyes fell on the containers, and for some reason his mind jumped to Madison. His expression became even uglier. How dare she, he thought, remembering what had happened with his wife earlier. He was in a bad mood and no longer on duty, meaning he didn't have to keep his emotions in check anymore. His temper was getting worse and worse, and he was losing his patience with Vivian. Quite straightforwardly, he told her, You can go now. Dr. Faltus was unhappy with his reaction, but she didn't dare stay any longer and test his patience. As she was leaving, she turned around and said, I know you didn't eat anything all day. At least have some food. There's soup and a sandwich. With that, she walked out and gently closed the door. He changed out of his work clothes and opened the window to let some air inside. He was irritated by the encounter with Dr. Fulda. Screw her. She can stay home tomorrow. I don't want to see her he thought. 
He didn't like the smell of her perfume. It reminded him of someone else. The office looked much better with the fresh air coming inside. He didn't touch the food on the table. He just sat in his office chair with his eyes closed and tried to fall asleep, but his body wouldn't listen. Eventually, he opened his eyes, feeling helpless, and looked at the phone on the table. He hesitated before reaching out and grabbing it. Finally, Madison's phone rang. She was in a cab, feeling somewhat nervous, because there had been several recent cases of university students going missing. She was on her way home, and shivered when she noticed the familiar scenery passing by on the road. She looked at her phone, saw it was her brother calling, and answered. Hey, Zach, she said sweetly. He knew that his sister was bold enough to go out alone at midnight, and he wanted to check up on her. He was relieved when she picked up. Where are you? he asked. On my way home, she answered. Alone? he asked. I called a cab, she replied. He didn't drive you back? Wait till I get my hands on him, Zach complained. Madison smiled stiffly. Zach wasn't that scary. She hadn't called her brother to pick her up, but she had at least told him where she was going. Zach instructed her to change the route and get out of bed to pick her up personally. She felt relieved when she sat inside his car about one-third of the way home. He looked at her unhappily and said, You went all the way there to bring him food, and he didn't even get someone to drive you back? He was busy, she said. He looked at her with disappointment, but didn't say anything else. However, it was evident that he was dissatisfied with Ian. Ian had been staring at the phone for quite a while now, and it distressed him to see that Madison was still on a call at this time of night. What is she doing? She should be sleeping, he thought. This was the start of a silent war between them. When Madison woke up the next day, the first thing she did was reach for the phone beside her pillow. She looked at the screen with eyes full of anticipation, but there were no messages. Is she so angry? she thought. She bit her lip and got up. After she had washed and dressed, she quickly got her things together and rushed downstairs. Only then did she realize that there wasn't a single person in the house. This surprised her, but she didn't think too much about it and left. She called a cab, and after she had sat down inside, her phone rang. When she saw Stella's name appear on the screen, she frowned but picked up anyway. Hi, she said into the phone. What's the matter? Stella seemed unhappy when she spoke, and Madison could hear the voices of several other women around her. She was probably at a gathering with her friends. I need you to go to the Pink Star and get some documents for your brother. I can't leave now, and your sister went out to find Luke again. They're so busy with the wedding. So you're the only one with some free time now, Stella informed. Did she forget that I'm also planning my wedding celebrations? Madison thought, irritated. She didn't feel comfortable going to the hotel alone like this. She wasn't sure it was just about picking up some documents for her. However, she didn't allow herself to get angry. She would have to manage somehow. Madison hung up and told the driver to take her to the Pink Star Hotel. On the way there, she decided to message Ian. Hi, I'm going over to the Pink Star for some documents. Can we get lunch after? She waited patiently for his reply, but she didn't get one. When she arrived at the hotel, she put away her phone, got out of the cab, and went inside. Madison gave the receptionist her name, and she looked her up, telling her the room number she was supposed to go to. What? Why am I going to a room? Is the Silverwood partner there? She thought. Although it struck her as strange, she shook it off and walked to the elevator. Behind her, the receptionist pursed her lips in disdain. One of her colleagues came over to her, and they began whispering. That was Madison Greenwald, the receptionist said. You thought she was getting married. She already is married, said the colleague, to that young doctor. He certainly doesn't have the reputation that Mr. Wanner has. I thought those were just rumors, the receptionist said. Well, you know how it is. There's no smoke without a fire, the colleague remarked and chuckled. Dr. Lopez, who happened to be in the hotel lobby, heard their discussion, and her mouth curled into a smile. 
Seems like Ian's perfect little wife is cheating on him, she thought. As soon as she stepped out of the hotel, she called him. Dr. Weston, she said. I just saw your wife at the Pink Star. She's checking into a room with another man. Her tone was soft, but with a trace of disdain. He has such poor taste. I'm much better than her. Maybe this will make him see that, she thought. She was interested in seeing Ian's reaction when he turned up and confronted his wife. Meanwhile, Ian took off his lap coat, grabbed his car keys, and hurried out. Madison knocked on the door lightly and heard footsteps coming from inside. Something felt off, and she was already a little flustered. Her body tensed in vigilance as she waited for the door to open. Her eyes widened, and her face paled when Drake opened the door. She took a step back, but he reached out and grabbed her wrist tightly. She could feel him pulling her into the room, and she tried to resist him, pressing her free hand against the wall and pulling against him. She looked at Drake with fearful eyes and noticed that he was wearing a bathrobe, and it was evident that he had no clothing underneath. From what she could see, he was the only one in the room. She was terrified of what might happen to her if she got inside. Let me go, I'm just here for the documents. Please, let me go. She knew that the Wanner Group collaborated with Silverwood on many projects, and that her father was already angry at her for not marrying Drake. She was afraid to annoy Drake too much, lest her father became even angrier with her. She didn't want to insult or hurt him unless it was absolutely necessary. And how will you get the documents if you don't come inside? Drake asked with a twisted smile. He was eyeing her with a predatory gaze, the hunger in his eyes so obvious that she felt like throwing up. He held her wrist with so much force that she was afraid he might break it. Sweet thing, you must pay the price for what you did to me. Now do as I say, or business will be very difficult for your family in the future. Come on in, and I'll show you a thing or two, Drake demanded. Madison could feel the panic clawing at her heart. Her breath quickened, and she clung to the door frame with all her might. She looked down the hallway, hoping to see someone who could help her, but no one was around. Ian, where are you? She thought, wishing her husband was there to save her. She didn't know why she wanted him in particular to show up, especially after the way he had left her the day before. I don't want them anymore. I'll send my brother over tomorrow to pick the papers up, she said, struggling against Drake. Her wrist hurt from all the pressure and friction, her skin a burning red patch. Please, let me go. My husband's waiting for me. But she was powerless against him. Her usual eloquence and glibness were useless when faced with brute force. She didn't have the slightest chance of overpowering Drake. All she could hope for was that someone would show up and see what he was doing to her. Drake smiled at Madison's words, his yellow teeth showing. He reached out his other hand and grabbed her waist. She unwittingly let go of the doorframe, and he pulled her close, his mouth touching her ear. I don't care if you want the documents or not. I'll make you beg for them later. With that, he pulled her into the room and kicked the door shut. Madison was beside herself with despair. She tried to push him away, screaming like crazy. No! No, I don't want to! You can't do this! I don't want to! Drake took her lack of cooperation as a game. The corners of his mouth curled into a smile as he looked at her beautiful face, now contorted with dread. I'll have her. If it weren't for my desire to take her, I'd never do business with John. Everyone knows he's a notorious scumbag, he thought. He held her tightly in his arms and tried to lick her ear. As Madison kept thrashing around to avoid him, he didn't manage that. Instead, he settled for whispering, Darling, you know I only did business with your father to get to you. I let your family take advantage of me, and all for nothing. You owe me this. Madison was so distressed she almost started crying, she didn't have time to even process his words before he pushed her down onto the bed. He was about to lay over her. She tried to roll over to the side, but he held her in place with his hands. Please! No, talk to my brother. I'm sure you'll come to an agreement. Please let me go, she begged. 
her face pale. She tried to move to the side of the bed, but couldn't get close enough to the edge. Drake finally had her in his arms and he was excited. In the last attempt to get him to stop, Madison said, Stella is coming here soon. They know I'm here. If I'm not outside in time, they're going to come and find me. They won't let you get away with this. Don't be stupid, darling. Your father and stepmother want us to get married. You think they're going to help you? I don't give a damn about you. Your father sent your brother out of the country all those years so that he couldn't interfere in our relationship. Drake laughed nastily. Madison paled, her body trembling. She was terrified by both his actions and his words. Tears kept prickling her eyes, but she refused to let them fall. They did this to me. They really did this to me. How can I not hate them? She realized. Seeing her reaction, Drake continued. What you should be worrying about now is serving me well. Once I'm satisfied, I'll marry you. Otherwise, you can go back to being a mere doctor's wife. A doctor's wife? She thought of her husband and trembled more, even intensely. Drake gave a sleazy smile and was about to kiss her. However, she turned her head away for him and used all her strength to shout out for the one person she wanted to see most right now. Ian! Her heart-wrenching scream was full of despair and humiliation. Trigger warning. The following episode contains descriptions of rape and violence, which some listeners may find disturbing. It is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Trapped in Drake's sturdy conspiracy, Madison struggled as she thought of Ian. Her body trembled, thinking what lay ahead. Deep down, she wished Ian to rescue her. Let me kiss you, hmm? Drake said, forcing himself on her further, with saliva dripping onto her cheeks. I've missed you so much. Madison was restricted by his body, and every attempt at a struggle to hurt her. Still, she tried to avoid him as best she could, making it hard for Drake to get comfortable. She tried her best to calm down and think of a way out. Let me go or this won't end well for you, she threatened him. For the first time, she mentioned her husband's true identity to Drake. My husband will end you. The Weston family will end you. He hadn't originally taken her threat seriously, but now he stiffened when he heard her last sentence. He looked at her with questioning eyes. The Weston family? Does she mean the Weston family? He thought. She tried her best not to tremble or be afraid. It was going to be okay. She was going to be okay. Her newfound power shone through her eyes, and she gave Drake a look of full dominant defiance. The dominance of the Weston family. From the moment she married Ian, she had become part of his family. And now, after knowing the full extent of what her father and stepmother had done to her, she resented even more that she was a member of their family. Madison's wrists and ankles were red and sore from her struggle, and her skin was torn in several places from his nails. But now that she had hope, not even the pain could divert her attention. Drake became somewhat hesitant. The last time he had seen Greenwald, he had his doubts about pursuing the matter with Madison. But he was so full of desire, he simply couldn't withhold this from himself. He thought of sleeping with the Weston's daughter-in-law and telling everyone about it, and the thought made him very happy indeed. Drake lowered his body over hers and gave her a wide grin. He said, Is your husband really a Weston? Good. Let him know this is all because he doesn't want to reveal who he is. Now do exactly as I say, and you won't suffer more than you have to. As soon as he finished speaking, he kissed her fiercely. He had been on guard the entire time, waiting for him to make a move. With a twist of her head, she broke the kiss. However, this time, his patience had run out. He slapped Madison hard across the face. He was furious. Give up. Nobody's coming to save you, he told her. Do you really think no one will dare touch you because you're a Weston now? Think again, Madison. You're done. Just give up. If you don't cooperate, I'll kill you. Drake threatened. The slap had been so hard that she could taste blood in her mouth. 
She had one hand free. With tears in her eyes, she didn't need the fake fear. She raised her hand to her cheek and gave him a defeated expression, pretending she was ready to give in. Drake seemed amused. He didn't believe that anybody was coming for her. From the moment she had knocked on the door, he had been in control. He wasn't going to waste his time with her anymore. That's more like it. Does it hurt? He asked. He reached out and touched her cheek. The disgusting look on his face made her want to vomit, but she held it in. Her other hand was now also free. However, she was still unable to move. You should have listened to me earlier, and then this wouldn't have had to happen. Oh, my poor Madison, I don't want to hurt you. Madison was trembling all over, and the unconcealed terror in her eyes gave him a feeling of extreme satisfaction. John had said that she was stubborn. But no matter how stubborn a woman is, she always submits to a man. And this woman is no exception, he thought. She endured his touch, waiting for her opportunity. Finally, when he raised his lower body and dipped in to kiss her again, she kicked him between the legs as hard as she could. He screamed, and his face turned red. He fell to the side and lay there, unable to straighten his body. She wanted to escape, but she was so weak that she almost fell down when she got off the bed. You bitch, he called, baring his teeth at her. His eyes were bloodshot, and he reached out his hand trying to grab her. Stop right there, I'll kill you. She scrambled away from him, not caring about anything else. Her ankle twisted as she rushed away and a sharp pain shot through it. She hit and continued to run toward the door. Drake forced himself to get up and follow her. She had hurt him, but it wasn't anything serious. He had only needed a moment to recover. After all, her body had become numb under its weight and had lacked its usual strength. She didn't dare look back. With every step, she got closer to the door, and hope in her heart grew. She bit her lip hard and swore to herself that if she got out, she would denounce the Greenwald family for bringing this upon her. From that day on, they would have nothing to do with each other. Madison's hands reached the door, but she was stopped by a sharp pain in her scalp. Drake was beside her, one hand gripping her hair, and the other pressed against the wall for support. She had already begun to turn the door handle, but now it was receding into the distance as he pulled her back into the middle of the room. He threw her onto the ground and kicked her. You have no idea what I'll do to you, he said. Madison held her head with both hands and could feel blood running through her fingers. She looked at the door, hoping someone would come in and end her misery. Ian, where are you? She cried out. Why haven't you come to save me? She thought. Ian! Her strength was almost completely exhausted by now. She had struggled against strength for so long that she was almost powerless. The door which was becoming blurrier and blurrier before her eyes, suddenly flew open. She sat on the ground, staring at it in a daze. She was beaten down, and her hair and clothes were ripped and tangled. A figure appeared before her, and when she saw who it was, the tears flowed freely down her face. Ian. It was Ian. He had finally arrived. He had rushed to the Pink Star after getting a call from Dr. Lopez, and had gone to see what Madison was up to. When he heard her desperate scream, he kicked in the door and entered. She smiled when she saw him. Ian looked at the sight before him, and the anger inside him surged. He took several big steps toward them, his expression dark. The hotel staff stood behind, watching the scene fearfully. They all shrank back in silence. Drake stared at Ian blankly, surprised by his sudden appearance. He was about to give him a piece of his mind, but Ian didn't give him a chance to speak. He swung his leg at him for a kick that hurled him to the ground. Ian's attack was on a completely different level than Madison's had been. He kicked him again with his tough leather shoes, and the man couldn't even scream. His hand loosened around Madison's hair. Ian walked right up to Drake with fiery eyes. He stepped on his chest and said, It seems you like violence. Well, you better watch out for me. He pressed his foot down harder until Drake began pleading with him. Satisfied with his whimpering and begging for mercy, Ian snorted and lifted his foot. 
The people behind him watched carefully. Ian turned around to Madison. She raised her eyes to look at him, and he crouched down beside her. She drew herself into his arms, crying, You're late, she said. He was going to... He was... Her sobs drowned out the rest of her sentence, but Ian knew very well what she had wanted to say. Ian held Madison in his arms. He let her cry all she needed. And when she calmed down a little, he helped her get up from the ground. He ignored the people around him, including the now unconscious Drake. When Madison got to her feet, she stumbled and fell limp, fainting in his arms. He picked her up gently and made his way down the corridor. The small group of people who had gathered stared at him, shocked by what they had just witnessed. He took her to the hospital and handed her over to one of his colleagues. Then Ian waited at the door, falling deep into thought. After a while, he stepped aside and dialed a number on his phone. Get ready, he said. I want the Wanner group finished. We want them destroyed, Ian ordered. Princess Reed, who was on the other side of the line, agreed, somewhat stunned by Ian's order. The call ended, and Ian went back to waiting. When the doctor finally came out, she was frowning. Extensive damage has been done to her scalp, she said. What happened? Did you have anything to do with this? She questioned seriously. Of course not. Ian shook his head. He walked into the room and went to Madison's side. She was sleeping. Her eyebrows knitted together in a frown. She seemed to be in the middle of a nightmare. He sat down and held her hand gently, not wishing to aggravate her further. He looked at the ointment on her wrist, and his heart ached. The doctor was right behind him. She sighed at the sight. She knew that Ian wouldn't do this to his wife, but she had needed to ask just to be sure. She saw the tension in his shoulders fall away, and she said, Her physical injuries will heal soon. As for the emotional damage, I can't say how it will affect her. You need to be there for her when she wakes up. Thank you, Ian said, his eyes still on Madison. The doctor pursed her lips and left, leaving the two of them alone in the room. Madison slept for a long time. When she woke up, it was six in the afternoon. Ian caught some sudden movement, and he relaxed when he saw that she was awake. He leaned forward and whispered, Madison. She flinched at the sound of his voice, and her eyes widened with panic. However, when she looked at him and saw the comforting gentleness in his eyes, she managed to relax a little. He gave her a soft smile and asked, Are you hungry? Tears rolled down her face and her lips trembled. She recalled texting him before heading out to the Pink Star. She had wanted to get lunch with him, and now he was there, asking if she was hungry. It was like the events at the hotel had only been a dream. Perhaps she had just slept at home, and now she had awoken to her beautiful, gentle husband offering her lunch. She reached out to him, trying to hug him around his neck. He leaned down, and she buried himself in his arms. She cried loudly, sobbing into his shoulder and holding on to him tightly. You came too late, she said. How could you leave me there with him? I was so scared. I'm so dirty now. How can I live like this? Every word was like a knife to his heart. She felt dirty. She didn't know how to live on. From the information he had gathered on her, she had been considered a young woman with strong morals and high intellect. Five years ago, her reputation had begun to unravel. But hearing her like this now, so worried about feeling dirty, Ian knew that she had always been honorable. Madison didn't serve what had happened to her. Looking at her now, he wanted to treat her better than he had up until then. He wanted to be a better husband. He caressed her back, letting her cry. He hoped that it would help her get rid of some of the pain. Finally... When she couldn't cry anymore, 
She stayed in the embrace, completely still. Ian got up and looked at her. Her eyes were red and swollen from weeping. He was about to say something when his phone rang. He looked at the caller ID. It was Francis. He picked up without taking his eyes off Madison. Francis, he greeted him. Madison sat up, feeling much better now that she had gotten some of the grief out of her system. However, her wrist and scalp still hurt. She waited for Ian to get off the phone. He listened intently to the man on the other side of the line, eyes flicking between her and the window. Madison got an uncomfortable feeling that something had happened. Ian moved the phone away from his ears and covered the microphone with his hand. The news had spread, he told her. Her face turned pale. It spread, she thought. She gave a little laugh, finding the whole situation amusing. So now everybody knew. Somebody had probably seen her struggling with all her might, covered in blood, and still decided to spread the news about her immoral behavior. That was just how people were. Ian paused and then continued. My family knows about it, too. The ironic smile on her face faded, and she became very still. They know about it, too. They won't accept me now. She began to worry. They won't want to be involved with someone like me. I'm too much trouble. Ian sighed. He opened his mouth to speak, but she beat him to it. Do you want to get a divorce? She asked. Madison looked down at her blanket. She sounded sad. The marriage hasn't been under my control from the beginning, and now it's not even under his. Our marriage has been questioned, confirmed, and now thrown out before the public, she thought. Everyone was looking at their relationship, scrutinizing and judging it. They all thought they knew best. Ian frowned deeply. He reached out and gently held her chin. He leaned into her, comforting her with a kiss. Madison relaxed into his touch and again began to cry. Her sadness now was somehow even more heartbreaking than before. She had never thought that her marriage would end like this, and she had never thought that it would move her this way. However, she also hadn't thought it would bring her so much strife. Ian seemed to feel her sadness, and his heart filled with anger. He was angry at what had happened to her, and angry at her for not listening to him. In his mind, this could have been prevented, if only she had trusted him. He drew the kiss out and finally let go. He pulled away and told her in a slightly domineering tone, We might just have to divorce if you still don't trust in me in the future. Madison was stunned. It took her a while to come back to her senses. It wasn't until Ian picked up the phone again and continued with this conversation that she snapped back into reality. She blinked at him as he hung up. She still didn't understand. Why is he like this? She thought. Why doesn't he want to divorce me? She turned to look out the window. Surely this is too much for any man to bear. I have a terrible reputation. I have no idea why he wants to face the public as my husband. Perhaps he even doesn't know why. But the only thing Ian knew was that he didn't want to see her this sad ever again. He brought her some food. Then he said goodbye and went to work. She was left alone in the room. Her phone lay on the bedside table, turned off. She knew everyone must be looking for her, but no one besides Ian knew where she was. Word of the day's events had gotten out, and she didn't have to think too much about what this would mean for her. Ian would surely be under a lot of pressure from his family. She thought for a long time, and then turned on her phone. It was full of new messages and missed calls. She looked through the call history and saw that most calls were from either the Greenwald or Ian's family. The texts were from only two people, her friend Allie and Ian. She opened Ian's reply and felt her heart fall into the palm of his hand. She knew that she would never get it back. For the last time, I am your husband. Call me Ian. She could feel his cold expression and his domineering words. And for some reason, they warmed her heart. When the whole world abandoned her, he had come to save her. He was by her side every time she needed him. She wanted to protect him in return. She wanted to give this a try. She wanted to see if she could save their marriage. She clicked on Diana's number 
and took a deep breath as the phone rang. When she heard her pick up, she said, Hello, Mrs. Weston. This is Madison. When Madison called, Diana was sitting on the couch in the Weston family home with a frown on her face. Olivia and Edward's phone had been ringing incessantly as people called to ask what was happening. The news of Ian and Madison's marriage had spread among the upper class, and many of their acquaintances were eager to talk about it. However, that wasn't the most pressing matter for the family just then. Unfortunately, some people had already heard about the incident at the Pink Star Hotel. When Olivia hung up, she looked particularly unhappy. She had begun to warm up to her new daughter-in-law, but any positive feelings she had were quickly disappearing. Madison, don't you think this is a bit much? Diana spoke into her phone, which she had put on speakerphone so everyone could hear. Her voice was tense, and she was clearly displeased as she said, The Weston family might not be able to handle you if this keeps up. There was a pause while Madison gathered her thoughts before she said, Mrs. Weston, I'm very sorry. It was my negligence that led to this embarrassment. Before Ian and I hold our full wedding ceremony, I'll clear the air and resolve any misunderstandings or grievances I've caused. She gritted her teeth as she spoke, but she was decisive. Oh, and how are you going to do that? One of Diana's eyebrows shot up as she was clearly doubtful of what her granddaughter-in-law was saying. Madison, you must know that you're in the eye of the storm right now. You haven't managed to clear your reputation over the past five years. And that was before the incident today. How do you expect to solve the issue now? Madison was silent for several seconds as she mustered her courage. Grandma, I'm finally going to confront these rumors directly. I've never been with any man, and I'm going to clear that up once and for all. Everyone will know the stories about me being promiscuous are untrue. The whole family was surprised. The day Ian had brought Madison to meet them, he had shown them a folder full of background information on her. She was indeed a pure and innocent young woman. But rumors could wreak havoc on someone's reputation, whether they were true or not. With everything that had been said about her over the previous five years, she would be a laughingstock if she publicly declared that none of it was true. Madison had endured everyone's scorn for five years. She had always thought that she would eventually meet the right person who would understand her. But she hadn't expected that to protect herself, Ian, and their marriage, she would have to take this step. Diana was silent for a long time before she spoke. All right, if you follow through on what you're saying, then the doors of the Weston family will stay open for you. However, if this doesn't solve anything... You and Ian will get divorced. Madison didn't seem surprised by Diana's words. The next morning, the Greenwald family discovered Madison had been taken to the hospital. They went to see her, and the first person to arrive was Zach. Madison looked up at him when he entered her room and smiled. Madison, are you hurt? Zach asked the moment he stepped in. Where is that scum? Do you want me to take care of him for you? His concern made her heart swell, but she gently shook her head to indicate that there was no need for that. Ian had already taught Drake a lesson, and she was going to be fine. The two of them chatted quietly for a few minutes before the rest of their family arrived. Madison was sitting up in the hospital bed with Zach standing beside her. Their parents and sister came in and stood in a group at the end of the bed, forming a united front. Madison, are you all right? Are you hurt? Stella leaned over the bed with a fake look of concern as she spoke. That Drake is really a piece of work. He actually tried to hurt you. Madison smiled as she watched her performance. She understood very clearly that if Zach had not been present, Stella wouldn't be acting so concerned about her. She's so fake. I bet as soon as we're alone, she'll be singing that man's praises again, she thought. Are you sure you're okay? I was so shocked when I heard the news, Kelsey said, taking a step forward. Her face was full of regret as she spoke. It's all my fault. If I hadn't gone to find Luke, then this wouldn't have happened. 
It's all my fault. Kelsey looked like she was about to cry. Stella quickly turned to comfort her and said, Darling, you can't blame yourself for what happened. That man has always been kind to your sister in the past. And I know he's always admired her. How did you know that he would do such a thing? Although she sounded like she was condemning Drake's actions, Madison felt that she was being too kind to him. He's always admired me? What's that have to do with this? He's an old pervert, not a secret admirer, she thought. Stella turned to look at John and said in an aggrieved tone, John, you must make this right for our Kelsey. Madison is now wrapped up in a huge scandal. We can't let Kelsey be implicated as well. She still needs to marry Luke. John took the opportunity to weigh in. There was a trace of dissatisfaction in his eyes as he pointed at his daughter's injuries and said, Madison, what are you going to do about this? Is Ian still willing to remain with you? Madison was used to being disappointed in her father, and she didn't have the energy to be upset about his anticlimactic reaction to what had happened. Dad, I think the better question is, what are you going to do? She looked straight at him and questioned. John didn't answer, but Zach narrowed his eyes at the question. He looked at Stella and Kelsey, seeming to understand something, and a cold expression washed over his face. He had always known that Stella wasn't Madison's biggest fan. But now it seemed like the entire family had united against his sister. Otherwise, he wondered, why would there have been such a scandal just after the news of her marriage was revealed? His heart tightened as he looked at Madison with eyes full of love. How badly have they treated you while I was gone? He thought to himself. John remained silent, but his brows were furrowing in irritation. He tried very hard to hide his feelings, but he was clearly unhappy about his daughter's question. We're in a very bad position, he finally said. I don't think Ian will be willing to continue being your husband now that your reputation has been ruined even further. In my opinion, Madison, you should take the step to divorce Ian and marry Drake. Dad! Zack immediately objected. He was shocked and angry. Drake is the reason Madison is here in the hospital. Would you really be willing to send her back to him? Would you want to destroy her entire life? Zach's words clearly indicated that he knew what John, Stella, and Kelsey were doing. It was hard to confront them directly, but Madison was his sister, and he couldn't just let them ruin her life. A trace of embarrassment flashed across John's face, and he glanced at Madison, who showed no reaction. He immediately knew that she was aware of what was going on. Destroy her life, he said sternly, squaring his shoulders. She's the one who's destroying her life, not me. If Madison had any self-respect, there wouldn't have been such horrible rumors over the years. There's been so much talk about her promiscuity and bad character, and then she caused such a scene yesterday. Do you really think that Ian will still be willing to stay with her and her terrible reputation? No one will be willing to have her as a wife now. John was furious. Zack had always been the pride of the family. He was young and had a promising future, and he was good friends with the eldest son of the Weston family. As long as Zack was on their side, it wouldn't be a problem for the Greenwalds to enter the upper levels of society. However, he constantly argued with his father over Madison. That's why it's so important to get her married off to Drake and out of my air, John thought. Madison lowered her head and listened silently as her father spoke. Her hands clenched into fists under the covers. John turned to look at his oldest daughter, becoming angrier as he pointed at her and complained, Look at her. What kind of person is she now? She pays no attention to me. Not long ago, I told her to marry Drake, but she was stubborn, and she put up a fight. She didn't want to accept reality. If she had listened to me, she would be living a comfortable life now. She wouldn't have to worry about food, clothing, or anything else for the rest of her life. I don't know what she was thinking, going off and marrying a poor doctor. If she had been more like her sister, we wouldn't be in this situation. Every word of every sentence pierced Madison's heart like a knife. I always knew they had a low opinion of me, but hearing it out loud is so much worse, she thought. 
She reached out and grabbed her brother's hand, shaking her head to indicate that he didn't need to speak. Zack had cared for her since they had been children, and she didn't want him to fall out with her father because of her. After all, Zack had been living as an illegitimate child for many years. It wasn't until Madison's mother passed away that John brought him back to live with them. She wouldn't let him throw away all the progress he made just to defend her. Dad, I won't leave Ian for Drake, Madison said with determination. She didn't give John a chance to respond before she continued. I know how to handle this, so you all don't have to worry. I'm married to Ian. We're soon going to hold a public wedding ceremony, and I'm going to be a part of his family as planned. John looked like he was about to explode in anger. I can't believe she's still trying to defy me after everything that's happened, he thought. In a mocking voice, he said, Madison, in your current condition, do you think he'll still want you? Your reputation is so bad that, regardless of how much money I spent on her engagement party, you might even ruin Kelsey's chances at marriage. Madison listened calmly, and instead of getting angry, she smiled and looked John in the eye. Zack looked worriedly at Madison, but before he could say anything in her defense, Kelsey cried out in a panic. Mom, I want to marry Luke. Don't let her ruin my life, too, she said, tears starting to pool in her eyes. She pulled Stella's sleeve as she turned to her sister and said, Madison, please don't ruin my chances at marriage. Luke and I really love each other, and I'm ready to be his wife. If you marry Drake, I'm sure he'll treat you very well. Madison looked coldly at Kelsey and didn't feel the slightest bit of pity for her tears. Stella and Kelsey were both leaning on the end of Madison's hospital bed and were beside themselves. But all Madison felt was annoyance. Gently peeling back the blanket, she got up. She walked a few steps to the door and turned around to look at her family, saying, I said all I'm going to say. I'll take care of my problems, so I don't need you to worry. Now, I need to rest. As she spoke, she opened the door and signaled that she wanted everyone to leave. Stella looked at her in disbelief, her face falling as she became flustered and started to fidget nervously. She went forward, grabbed Madison's wrist, and in a pitiful voice said, Are you angry with me? You blame me for asking you to go and get those documents, don't you? That's why you're treating your father so harshly. Don't be like this, she continued. It was my fault. Kelsey or I should have gone and gotten the papers. We don't want anything bad to happen to you. Please, don't be angry with your father. He cares about you. We all do. Can you forgive me? Stella faked. Madison raised her eyebrows, amused, but not surprised by her stepmother's behavior, and laughed. She knew her family's concern was all fake, but it had taken her a while to accept that. For the longest time, she had been very careful to act appropriately and do what she thought her family wanted, hoping to earn some of her father's affection in the process. After this incident, however, she realized how pointless it all was and gave up on trying to please them. I'm so tired of these games, she thought pulling her hand back from Stella's grip. Unexpectedly, Stella snatched her hand again, squeezing the area on her wrist where she had been injured and causing her to cry out in pain. John strode forth, raising his hand as if he was going to hit his daughter. But before he could strike, Ian appeared in the doorway, causing her father to freeze. Zack had started to move in her defense, and he also stopped in his tracks. What do you think you're doing? Ian demanded in a cold voice. He stood at the door with fury written on his face as he stared his father-in-law down. His anger was so intense it seemed tangible, and everyone in the room felt the tension rising. Walking up to Madison, he reached out and pulled her into his arms, breaking Stella's hold on her in the process. Mr. Greenwald, where do you hear that I don't want to remain with my wife? Please let me know so I can notify my lawyer and prosecute them for defamation, Ian demanded. 
John lowered his hand with a hateful look on his face. He glared at Ian and replied, I'm your father-in-law. Have you no notions of courtesy? How dare you talk to me this way? Ian smiled, though the smile didn't reach his eyes. A second ago, you tried to get your daughter to leave me. And now you want me to treat you as my father-in-law? That's very strange, he mocked. John's face twisted into something ugly. But he took a step back and pretended to be calm. Well, the least you can do is make sure I don't hear any more bad rumors about my daughter. She's young and oblivious, John stated. Ian tightened his grip on Madison. He glared at John. Mr. Greenwald, you seem to have misunderstood me. The only reason I'm treating you with respect at all is because of Madison. As for Drake, he's not a good man. Why would you want to condemn your daughter to a life with that kind of person? He encountered. Stella and Kelsey's expressions started to tighten. They had heard how Ian had helped Madison fight off Drake, and they weren't sure they could withstand his anger. Zack looked at his father in disbelief and felt a wave of disappointment wash over him. Ian didn't give John a chance to reply. He continued, Even though you're Madison's father, we've already gotten our marriage certificate, and you have no right to force us to divorce. When he finished, he helped Madison get back into bed. His careful and gentle movements made Kelsey bite her lower lip. Overcome with jealousy, she thought, I can't believe he can stand to touch her with the reputation she has. She frowned, and in an aggrieved tone said, I heard that you saved my sister. When you went in, how did you find her? Madison stiffened, and she glared at her sister. Without waiting for her husband to speak, she replied, Thank you for your concern, but your worry is unnecessary. I fought him with all my strength, which is how I got injured. Luckily, I was able to fend him off until Ian found me. She understood the seed that Kelsey was trying to plant in Ian's mind. Her sister was trying to imply that Drake's attack had been successful, and that he had managed to molest her. What a disgusting thing to try to do, she thought, disappointed but not surprised by her sister's intentions. Kelsey looked annoyed at her response. If that's the case, then great, she reluctantly said to Ian. But before you get married, you should probably check to be sure she added. Madison thought her sister couldn't make her any more serious. She had been wrong. She gasped in anger, picked up a cup of water from her bedside, and threw the drink in Kelsey's face. Do you have no shame at all? she demanded. Her face flushed as she glowered at the other woman. Her family was too shocked by her anger to react. Madison sat up straight and shouted at Kelsey. How dare you come here and insult me when I'm lying in a hospital bed? I'm warning you now not to push me any further, Madison warned. The entire room was silent. No one in the family had ever seen her get angry. This was the first time they were witnessing her temper firsthand. Ian sat on the edge of the bed and reached out to caress Madison's back in an unspoken gesture of support. His heart ached for her. Kelsey returned to her senses and began to sob as she threw herself into Stella's arms. Mom! Dad, I didn't mean it like that! She cried. You didn't even hear what I said! I'm just trying to look out for her! She pulled out of her mother's arms just enough to look at her sister and continued. Madison! How could you think so little of me? It was not my intention to insult you. Then she leaned back into Stella's arms and kept crying. Madison closed her eyes and leaned against Ian in exhaustion. Her sister's never-ending dramatics were getting to be too much for her. Everyone knows what she was trying to say. I don't know why she insists on acting this way, she thought. John looked at his sobbing daughter and felt aggrieved. He took a step forward and was about to speak when Ian held up a hand. Madison is tired. I think it's time for you to leave. He stood up and personally escorted the visitors out including Zack. When he returned to the room, Madison had already laid down and closed her eyes. She looked exhausted. Ian was about to say something when his phone rang. Not wanting to wake up his wife, he went out into the hallway to answer it. After he stepped out, Madison opened her eyes and tried to listen to what he was saying. He's my only hope now. 
No matter what else happens, I have to hold on to that man. Otherwise, I'm destined to be sacrificed in the name of my family's business dealings, Madison realized. Taking a deep breath, she took out her phone and made a call. I don't care how hard it is, but I'm going to finally stop these ridiculous rumors, she promised herself. When she heard someone answer, she spoke. Yes, hello, is this the Daily Inquirer? I'm Madison Greenwald. After she told her story to the reporter on the other end of the line, she hung up and repeated her actions with another news outlet. Regardless of whether the person who answered was friendly or mocking, she spoke pleasantly and got right to the point. She was determined to not give the press any more ammunition to use against her by speaking rudely to them. She only made three phone calls, which was enough to cause a media storm throughout the city. By the time Ian returned, she had already finished making her calls. She was sitting quietly on the bed and smiled at her husband, revealing two small dimples on her cheeks. Ian walked over and gently took her hand to inspect the wound on her wrist. Madison, when did you graduate? Unexpectedly, he asked. She had said that she wanted to wait until after she had graduated to hold her public wedding celebration, and she intended to honor that request. Madison swallowed hard before she turned to Ian and asked the question that had been on her mind for a long time. Why did you agree to my proposal? His eyebrows shot up in surprise, and he felt like his heart had suddenly skipped a beat. Almost immediately, she regretted asking that question. I don't know if I really want to hear the answer, she realized. When her husband looked into her eyes and seemed to be about to reply, she quickly interjected, Forget it. I'm not sure I want to know. She looked away to avoid his gaze, but the corners of her mouth raised as she continued. No matter what your reason was, we're married now. It isn't realistic to get a divorce. I just need to remember that you're my husband, and that's enough. Ian didn't say anything, and the look on his face gave no clues as to what he was thinking. Oh, right, we have to go to your grandma's house and talk about this anyway, Madison said still not giving him a chance to speak. She was panicking a little about the question she had asked and was trying to change the subject. You know, I'm a little scared of her. By the way, you can tell your parents that I'm going to be discharged tomorrow afternoon. When this whole mess is over, we can let my brother meet them. Then we can make wedding plans with your family, she asserted. Madison ran out of things to say and sat there uneasily for a moment. Looking around for a distraction, she poured herself a glass of water and drank it. Ian felt his heartache at her obvious anxiety. He was about to say something when his phone rang again. This time, the call was coming from his family. He gestured to her that he was going to go in the hall again and walk away to answer. Madison watched him go and let out a sigh of relief. As they had gotten closer over the previous few days, she had realized that she wanted to know more about his life and begin to get involved in it. That had never happened when she was with Luke. She pressed her hand over her heart and felt it beating intensely. This is crazy. We met such a short time ago, but now all I want to know is if there's any chance he could fall in love with me, she thought. She leaned back on her pillows, feeling resigned. I think I'm in love with him already, she thought. The feeling was strange. It was frightening to realize she already cared for him and to imagine that he could change his mind about their relationship and leave at any moment. She wasn't sure she could bear it if that happened. She lay on her hospital bed and let her imagination run wild until eventually she dozed off. It wasn't until a nurse came over to change her drift that she woke up. As she looked at the ceiling with wide eyes, she tried to comfort herself. It's going to be fine. No matter what the outcome of this is, it could have been worse. I just have to treat this like a gamble. I might not have a lot of capital to work with, but if I play my cards right, I think I can make the best of the situation, she mumbled. The next day, Ian had planned to return to his family home to appease them, as Madison had suggested. However, he unexpectedly got called into work, so he went over to busy himself with surgery. By the time his shift was over, it seemed like the whole world had changed. 
Mercy Hospital was especially lively that day. Madison had been discharged early in the morning and was heading toward a taxi. However, from the moment she walked out of the hospital doors, there were cameras and microphones trained on her. There were reporters from the three biggest media giants in the city, The Daily Inquirer, Channel One News, and The Morning Journal. Clearly, Madison was a popular topic in the city just then. Miss Greenwald, a reporter from the Daily Inquirer said, sticking her microphone in Madison's face. May I ask what prompted you to make this decision? The reporters from the other two outlets were also hovering and waiting for her answer. It was because of the new rumors that started two days ago. Madison walked over to the taxi but paused before she got in. From the moment she had called these reporters, she knew there would be no going back. The road ahead would be very difficult, and no one would be able to help her with this, but it had to be done. Miss Greenwald, the Channel One reporter interjected when she didn't answer. Do you know who started the rumors about you? Did someone set you up, or are they true? Are you really as immoral as these stories make you seem? Instead of answering their questions, Madison opened the taxi door and quietly sat down. This incensed the journalists, who worried they might not get any information they could use. A reporter from the Morning Journal pushed to the front and sharply asked, Miss Greenwald, did you come forward because of this latest scandal? Is your partner upset with you, and you're trying to clear your name to salvage your relationship? Madison's only response was a sly smile before she shut the car door and gave the driver the address of her destination. The reporters followed her until she arrived at a small clinic. She got out of the taxi thinking, this is the most ridiculous and humiliating thing I've ever had to do. However, she squared her shoulders and marched in for her examination. While she had heard of this place, she had never been here in person. The lobby was full of people and the reporters tried to follow her inside though a few nurses forced them to stay right by the door. Before walking ahead, Madison turned to the reporters and said, I'm glad you're here. I've come here today to clear my name and restore my reputation. I'll be back shortly with the results. With that, she took a deep breath and followed a nurse inside. The cameras behind her kept flashing, and the anticipation was palpable. What followed was probably the most uncomfortable 15 minutes of Madison's life. While the staff was kind and the examination was over quickly, the entire experience was something she would have preferred to live without. She had never thought that one day she would use such a method to prove her innocence. Five years before, when the rumors had just started about her, she had never felt such humiliation and panic. Since then, she had done her best to grin and bear the gossip, but now she knew that if she didn't face this head-on, it would never end. I just want to have a clean slate and get on with the rest of my life, she thought, as her mind drifted to Ian. He deserves better than to be followed by these stupid rumors for the rest of our lives together. After Madison was finished, she got dressed and calmly went back into the hall. The doctor walked alongside her with her results in his hand. They went back to the lobby, where the reporters all clamored to get the best photo of her, causing the doctor to blink rapidly as his eyes became adjusted to the flashing lights. After a minute, he held up the report in his hand and said, After the examination just now, I can tell everyone clearly. He paused for a moment, causing the whole room to fall silent. Everyone was breathlessly waiting for his answer. However... Madison's face was pale, and she clenched her hands. While this had been her idea, she was very uncomfortable with the situation. The doctor turned to look at her with a look of pity on his face. He waited until she glanced over at him and nodded before he raised his voice and declared, From what we saw in our examination, I can say with certainty that Madison Greenwald is still a virgin. With that one sentence, the room erupted. Onlookers were gossiping furiously, and reporters were shouting questions simultaneously. What's the reason you decided to come here? One of them asked. Are you doing this for your partner? Another reporter questioned. Why didn't you stop these rumors five years ago? A third one interjected. Since his job was done, the doctor turned around 
and returned to the exam room with one last sympathetic look at his patient. That left Madison alone with all the reporters. Raising her head to look at the cameras, she held herself with fierce determination. She spoke softly, but firmly, and without fear as she said, I came here today to prove that I'm innocent of all the derogatory reports that have been made about me over the last few years. My reputation has been unfairly tarnished. Now I'm finally putting these rumors to rest. As she spoke, everyone fell silent so they could hear every word. After a pause, she continued, From now on, I hope that any baseless stories about my character will be viewed as the ridiculous rumors they are. The journalist who had followed Madison to the clinic had already broadcast her announcement live. Some people would be fascinated with the story, while others would hardly pay attention to it at all. No matter their opinion, however, much of the city would become aware of the revelation in just a few hours. Madison was 23 years old that year. It had been rumored that she had been dating a boyfriend for four years in college, but as her trip to the clinic had proved, she was still a virgin. While some would be suspicious of the story, the exam was enough to convince most people that the horrible rumors about her were false. Madison's heart was filled with bitterness despite her reputation being cleared. This is what I wanted for so long, but I wish it wouldn't have to happen this way. This was absolutely humiliating, she felt. Shortly after her announcement, John and Stella appeared at the scene, which felt ridiculous to Madison. Stella had tears running down her face, and she threw her arms around Madison, as though she was protecting her from some attack. She turned around to look at the cameras and angrily said, Haven't you done enough to her? Will you finally let this go? Let me tell you, from now on, if I see any of you slandering Madison again, the Greenwald family won't sit by and let it happen. If she'd come to her stepdaughter's defense when the rumors had first started, Madison would have been touched. Unfortunately, this was the first time Stella had ever protected her and tried to use the family name in her defense. John stood next to them with a frown. He reached out and patted his daughter's shoulder, an expression of sympathy on his face. At that moment, Madison almost cried, but it wasn't because she was touched by their actions. If they actually cared about me, they would have put a stop to this a long time ago, she thought bitterly. I would never have been forced to take care of this myself. She knew very well that instead of helping, her family had only added fuel to the fire. They were only there at that moment because it would hurt their image not to show up for her. Madison, it's my fault, her father said. As your father, I should have protected you. With that, John looked at the reporter in front of him with a stern face. He placed his free hand over his heart as he continued... I promise that from now on, if anyone dares to slander my daughter, then I, John Greenwald, will use all my family's power to seek justice for her. What a good parent, Madison thought sarcastically, annoyed that her parents were making the situation about them. They're probably hoping this will boost the value of Silverwood's shares. She just stood quietly and didn't say a word, hoping that she might be able to make her escape soon. All she wanted was to go home, and she didn't think anyone would stop her. After all, in everyone's eyes, Madison was the one who had suffered humiliation. However, John was shamelessly soaking up all the attention and using it for his own gain. She pulled herself out of her stepmother's arms and started to move through the crowd. John watched her walk away and said, Madison, go home and get some rest. Don't worry about a thing. You can rest assured that you'll be able to marry Drake Wanner. I won't let you suffer any more. Madison froze in her tracks as that sentence caused the crowd to explode in excitement. She slowly turned around and glared at her father in disbelief as the reporter started yelling out questions again. He's so shameless. He's using this to try and force my hand. That's the only reason he would say Drake's whole name like that, she thought. Mr. Greenwald, is that true? Your daughter wants to marry Drake Wanner from the Wanner Group? A reporter asked. 
Mr. Greenwald, isn't Mr. Wenner the one who humiliated your daughter two days ago? Another one inquired. Mr. Greenwald, is Madison married to a doctor at Mercy Hospital? When did that change? A third one jumped in. The reporter's questions were directed at John, and Madison had yet to gather herself enough to speak. She heard him say, Everyone, you all know I'm a father, so naturally I want what's best for my children. Although the doctors at Mercy Hospital are fantastic, Madison is still my little girl and the light of my life. I don't want her to suffer by being with someone so ordinary. The previous announcement resulted from Madison believing that a doctor was the best husband she could hope for. However, I have arranged for her to marry Mr. Wanner, who has a richer family background and knows how to take care of others. I know she will have a wonderful life with him, John announced. Madison leveled an icy stare at her father. He had disappointed her time and time again, but somehow she was still surprised by how shameless he could be. At that point, she couldn't act in anger. If she did, she would destroy the reputation she had just managed to restore. Before John could say anything else, she suddenly took a few steps back toward her parents and took one of each of their hands in hers. The crowd quieted down when they saw this, feeling something important was about to happen. The moment she took their hands, Madison allowed a single tear to fall down her cheek. She lowered her head, as if she was ashamed, and spoke, Dad, I'm so sorry. I can't marry the man you chose for me. John's face turned cold. Stella closed her eyes for a moment and muttered curses in her head. They had been attempting to use the situation for their own benefit, but their strategy had backfired. The reporter closest to them seized the opportunity to ask, Miss Greenwald, what do you mean by that? Is the news that you've married the surgeon from the Mercy Hospital true? With that, the other journalists quickly chimed in with their own questions. Are you doing this because you're angry with your family? Is there some kind of feud we should know about? Someone from the crowd asked. Miss Greenwald, did you come here today because of your husband? Another one questioned. Why can't you marry Mr. Wanner? Another chimed in. More tears slipped down Madison's face as she raised her head and stubbornly stared down her father. While she was using them for her own advantage, her tears were real. She was so hurt and frustrated by her family's treatment of her that she couldn't hold them in any longer. When she looked at her father, all she could think of was endless trouble they had given her. Even though she was his oldest daughter, he treated her worse than a stranger. My father can try to force me into submission in front of so many people, but I won't stand for it. I will never willingly marry Drake, she thought. Madison didn't give John a chance to react, as she continued to speak calmly and clearly. I came here today to be examined and restore my image, as I said before. I wanted to prove my innocence and wash away the reputation that has been pressing down on me for five years. As for Mr. Wenner, it will be impossible for me to follow my father's wishes, since I have a husband and intend to remain by his side, she announced. As soon as she finished speaking, the entire room was in an uproar. Madison squared her shoulders and waited for the commotion to die down before she continued. Dad, I'm sorry for how I handled this, but what's done is done. I am already legally married, and I don't intend to divorce my husband. I can't do as you wish and marry the man you selected for me. I can only hope that you will give your blessing to my husband and me, and acknowledge us as a couple she requested earnestly. The surrounding people continued to shout questions at them. In the end, John couldn't fight against public opinion and was forced to reluctantly bless the marriage. Madison cried tears of joy as she heard her father do so. Of course, the reporters were still determined to get as much information as possible, and they continued to pester her with questions. Miss Greenwald, how did you and your husband get to know each other? Are you really married to an ordinary doctor? Miss Greenwald, what is your husband's status at Mercy Hospital? Suddenly, everyone's questions were focused on Madison and her husband, though she didn't dare to answer them. She had deliberately avoided mentioning Ian's name the entire time, before getting permission from the Weston family 
she would never reveal Ian's true identity. At that point, she could only lower her head and smile shyly. However, she hoped that restoring her reputation would allow her and Ian to continue their relationship without any further hurdles. By the time Ian came out of the operating room, several hours had passed since Madison's announcement. He quietly stood in the corner of the elevator, clueless as to what had happened that day. He closed his eyes and tried to relax, but soon the elevator was filled with people. They ignored him, but he couldn't ignore the gossip they were sharing. Did you watch Madison Greenwald on the news this afternoon? One of them spoke. How could I not see it? That was so shocking. She's actually still a virgin. Another one replied. She must be so brave to have done that. I felt so bad for what she's been through. She seems like a great person. A third one added. She does. Her husband sure found himself a treasure. The first one stated. At least he was smart and took her straight to the courthouse. Otherwise, her parents would have married her off to someone else. The second one replied. Ian opened his eyes and stared at the ceiling as he listened. When the elevator arrived at their floor, the gossipers dispersed, leaving him to walk to his office alone. He ignored the curious looks people threw at him along the way and thought, Oh, Madison, what did you do? As soon as he reached his office, he whipped his phone out of his pocket and typed his wife's name into an online search. Immediately, the video from that afternoon popped up. He took a deep breath and watched it. After it was over, Ian could only stare at the screen with wide eyes. Before he had time to think, he got a call from his family. He answered it, and they asked him to bring Madison over to the house again the next day. With the day's events finally over, Madison locked herself in her room and fell asleep. None of her family tried to come and bother her. When she finally woke up, it was 10 o'clock at night. Looking at her phone, she saw a missed call from Allie, but other than that, no one had tried to reach her. She stood up, walked to the window, and opened it so she could feel the cool breeze as she stretched. A moment later, her phone rang. She paused for a moment with her hand outstretched. When the call was about to go to voicemail, Madison sat on the bed and answered it. Her free hand gripped the sheet tightly as she said softly, Hi, Ian. Two seconds of silence passed before she heard him sigh. Then he said, I'm outside your house. Come here for a minute. She was surprised, but Ian hung up before she could reply. After checking herself in the mirror and straightening up her clothes, she ran out. She saw Ian leaning against his luxury SUV, which was parked under the street lamps at the end of the driveway. As usual... There was an imposing aura around him, even though he looked relaxed. As she walked toward her husband, she felt like she was stepping into an unknown world. She took several deep breaths, trying to keep her chaotic emotions under control. Ian had seen her the moment she stepped out of her front door. She wasn't wearing any makeup, revealing her natural, delicate features. She seemed to have an otherworldly beauty at that moment. He didn't speak for a long time, and she started to feel anxious. She tilted her head and said with a smile, Ian, why are you here so late? Don't tell me you want more of that grilled cheese I made. It was clearly a joke, but for some reason, she noticed a puzzled expression cross his face. He furrowed his brows. You made grilled cheese? He questioned. Madison frowned. I brought it to your office the other night with some soup. Didn't you eat it? She asked. Maybe he doesn't like that kind of food. She thought, I don't have any idea what he likes to eat. Something suddenly seemed to click in Ian's mind. You brought that? He repeated. Madison let out a short laugh. Who else would have brought it to you? I waited for you for hours, but then I met Dr. Falta. She said you would be stuck in surgery for quite a while, so I left it on your desk. She explained. She was surprised they had gotten onto this topic. Just then, she remembered something and said, Didn't you see the note I left for you? It was on the container. Ian narrowed his eyes and looked at her for a minute, before he suddenly smiled. His expression baffled Madison, and she was starting to get frustrated with him. It was obvious that he must have misunderstood something. Taking a step forward, she narrowed her own eyes and asked, Ian, 
Where did you think that food came from? Ian found that the gloomy mood that had lingered around him that day was improving with their conversation. He reached out to take his wife's hand and led her toward the house. You know, I'll take you up on your offer. Could you make me another one? Dr. Fulpas had told him that she had brought the food, so he had tossed it all in the trash in annoyance. He felt guilty about that now, and he was curious to try Madison's cooking. Madison followed him into the house. There was no one around, and they had privacy. She went into the kitchen and gathered her ingredients. Then she started heating up a pan on the stove. Instead of going to the living room to wait, Ian leaned against the doorway between the kitchen and dining room as he watched his wife melt butter for the sandwich. The corner of his mouth turned up in an affectionate smile. There were two reasons he had come over that night. One was to tell Madison that they were going to visit his family the next day, and the other was to see how she was feeling after her ordeal. It was a happy coincidence that they had cleared up the misunderstanding about the food she had made him as well. Next time you go to the hospital, make sure you ask for me. Don't just leave a note, he said, as she placed two slices of bread in the pan. No matter how busy I am, I'll find time to pop into the office to see you, he added. How do I let you know I'm there? She asked. I waited until almost three in the morning. I wasn't sure how long you would be. For all I knew, it would be dawn before I saw you. Madison responded. He raised his eyebrows, surprised that she had stayed so late. How did you get home? Well, I called my brother and asked him to come pick me up. Madison lied. Zach had actually called her when she was already in a taxi on her way home. But what she was saying was mostly true. She carefully placed the cheese on the bread. I didn't want to risk trying to go back by myself so late, she added. I wasn't sure if it would be safe. Her eyes narrowed as Ian processed what she had said. So Zach was the one she was on the phone with for so long. She combined the two halves of the sandwich together, turning off the stove, and went over to the fridge to get some leftover soup. After she heated it up, she grabbed it to take to the table. However, Ian was standing in the doorway and was blocking the way to the dining room. She squeezed by, but instead she asked, Ian, could you sit at the table? He quirked an eyebrow as he straightened up and went to the dining room table, making room for his wife to pass by. Then she turned back to grab the finished sandwich and bring that over as well. As soon as the food arrived, he dug into it. It was delicious, and it worked wonders to improve his mood. Madison wasn't hungry, so she sat in a chair across from him. As she watched him eat, she thought about how she would handle things with his family the next day. Should I just go over there, or should I call Ian first? She thought. Just then, her family returned, and she stood up without even thinking. John and Stella came to the door with Kelsey not far behind them. Zach, however, was not with them. Hello, Madison politely called out. Remembering that Ian was still there, she turned to him and was surprised to see he was still focused on his food. However, a cold and serious look had come over his face. John was furious the instant he saw Madison. After they had finished dealing with the reporters earlier, they had immediately run to Drake's house. The man was angry beyond words and took out his frustration on the business. Madison's actions earlier had caused them serious business losses. You really are part of Ian's family now, Stella said looking at Ian in annoyance. In her view, he was the reason they had lost so much that day. It's late at night. Why did you let him come in to eat so late? Madison didn't respond. She didn't think she had done anything wrong that day, but she knew that she had caused her family to lose out on an opportunity they had been counting on. However, she knew that her stepmother would be too afraid to speak too badly about Ian to his face. After finishing the last spoonful of soup, Ian wiped his mouth and went to stand by his wife. He looked at his in-laws and said, I guess you've forgotten what you said in front of the reporters today. His voice flat indicated that he was clearly unhappy with them. Before continuing, he reached out and wrapped an arm around Madison's waist. I want to make this very clear. If anyone tries to spread baseless accusations about my wife again, I'll use the full force of the Weston family to make them regret it. The Greenwalds exchanged confused looks when they heard his last sentence. They clearly didn't know what he meant when he referred to the full force of his family. On top of that, 
The glare he was leveling at them made it clear that if any rumors did surface around Madison, he would assume they had something to do with it. The obvious threat gave them pause. John frowned, and for the first time, he looked at Ian carefully. A sinking feeling appeared in the pit of his stomach as he realized that he had missed something important. The Weston family, he repeated in his mind. Is Ian Weston one of those Westons? The famous Weston family had always kept a low profile, so he wasn't aware of the names of all the family members, and it was a fairly common second name. But now, when he studied Ian, he thought that the way he carried himself seemed to mark him as someone from the highest levels of society. Shocked, John blurred out, Ian, who are you? After he spoke, silence descended on the room. No one dared to speak as they waited for Ian's answer. देखा आपने यहाँ तो लोग बड़े धूमधाम से मना रहे हैं अरे यही थी हम जगह उत्सव का माहौल है कल्याण ज्वेलर्स सेलिब्रेटिंग टू हंड्रेड शो रूम विजिट नाउ फॉर एक्साइटिंग ऑफर्स इन वॉज नो हरी टू एंसर जॉन्स क्वेश्चन स्लाइटली लुकिंग स्ट्रेट एट हिस्स न्यू फादर इन लॉ इन सर कॉमले I'm a surgeon at Mercy Hospital. My name is Ian Weston. John frowned, dissatisfied with the answer he had received. Weston, he thought. Surely not one of the Westons. Billionaires don't bother to qualify as doctors. Weston's a common name. He was clearly about to continue his interrogation, but Kelsey jumped in to say, Dad, we're back today. Why is he asking me that now? John thought irritably, but then realized that his daughter was cleverly leading him to think of something important. That's right. Since Zack is friends with Daniel Weston, if Ian was Daniel's younger brother, then Zack ought to know him. He'd have told me. He frowned as he thought it through. Zack's not here today because he went to meet Daniel, who's just gotten back from a business trip in Scotland. I heard that Daniel rushed home to attend his brother's wedding. But since Zack hasn't told me anything about it, it's clearly a different Weston and a different wedding. This Ian is a nobody. Having reached this conclusion, he looked at Ian and Madison gloomily. There was nothing more to say, so he just snorted coldly and flopped down on the couch. Shella joined him. Madison looked up at Ian beside her. He looked back at her gently and didn't say anything. They sat down on the couch opposite and Ian asked, Mr. Greenwald, are you free for dinner tomorrow? My parents would like to extend an invitation. Stella gave a cruel laugh. Do you think, because you brought gifts when you first came to see us, that we'll think your family is on the same social level as us? What kind of background does your father have? How does it compare to the Greenwald name? Asking us to eat at your parents' home is a joke, she remarked in a mocking tone. Madison has made me look a fool. I urged John to force her hand in front of the reporters and it blew up in my face. Why must Madison be so unwilling to compromise? Stella thought furiously. Madison shot Ian a word glance. Sure enough, his face was getting darker and darker with each word out of Stella's mouth. His eyes were arctic. What must he think of this dysfunctional family? She thought. I've seen what a good relationship he has with his own parents. No one would be able to listen to someone insulting their parents like this without getting angry. Not unless they were holding a real grudge. I certainly wouldn't object if anyone talked about Stella like that. Ian narrowed his eyes at Stella, and the warning in their depths made her shiver uncontrollably. Her mouth snapped shut, and she didn't dare say another word. Her arrogance suppressed. Kelsey clenched her fist a wronged expression on her face. Then she forced her features into a mask of contrition and struck Ian's sleeve. I'm sorry, Ian. My parents promised they would join me for dinner tomorrow. I didn't mean to create a conflict with my dear brother-in-law's clan. 
Madison, sitting on Ian's other side, looked around him and narrowed her eyes at Kelsey. I've got a bad feeling about this, she thought. But she couldn't have worried. Ian could handle it. Since I'm your dear brother-in-law, please maintain a polite distance and refrain from these inappropriate flirtations, he said mockingly. Kelsey went pale with indignation, and she stared at Ian impotently. John and Stella's expression turned ugly. Kelsey made a show of dropping Ian's sleeve and backing away. Look, I don't know what Madison's told you about me, she said. I know she doesn't like me, and I'm sure you've been influenced by her opinions. But I was only trying to be friendly. Whatever you think of me, I am your sister-in-law now, after all. Stella patted. Kelsey is a terrible liar. No one would believe that. As usual, she needs me to come and dig her out of a hole, she mumbled. Watch your mouth, young man. My Kelsey is a good girl. She's engaged to Luke Morris, and she would never flirt with someone else. Won't stand for you slandering her, she scolded Ian. Ian looked around at the family coldly. Mr. Greenwald, are you sure you won't be able to attend dinner? For the last time, he asked. John snorted angrily. Sorry, but someone of my standing doesn't eat with just anyone. If someone wants the kudos of my company, they have to have a decent name for themselves, like the Morrises have. He got up and stormed out of the room without bidding his guest goodbye. Since you've decided to marry beneath you, then don't come crying to us when you need money. We won't help you, Stella told Madison. I certainly won't come begging, Madison said. I know my family won't help even if I beg. They just love to see me humiliate myself by asking. But I won't. I married a doctor, not a dustman, she thought. They all settled into an uneasy silence. Madison sighed and said softly to Ian, Are we really eating with your parents? That will be our wedding dinner, she thought nervously. I know it has to happen sooner or later, but because my family wants nothing to do with it, I'd hoped we could just skip all the fuss beyond our simple civil wedding. But that's not what Ian wants. Ian, sensing her inner turmoil, took her hand and squeezed it gently. It's fine. I'm here, he assured. So far in this marriage, Madison had made all the steps to move things forward. This last step had to be Ian's. I don't know how he's going to deal with my messed up family, she worried. But when she looked into his eyes, she saw only stability. That night, after seeing Ian off, she slept remarkably well. The following morning, Madison woke before Ian arrived to pick her up. As she was scrambling some eggs for breakfast, Stella came into the kitchen and threw some papers onto the table. Madison paid her no attention, so Stella called her over. Come and find me so you can finish cooking later. I'm in a rush, so I need you to do this now. Your father's already gone to work. Madison paused with a heavy heart. John doesn't treat me as a daughter, she thought sadly. I wish I had a reason to believe I wasn't actually his biological child. An appetizing smell rose from the pan. Madison sighed as she washed her hands. Stella impatiently thrust the documents under her nose. Madison's brows knitted as she looked at the agreement. My eggs will go hard, she thought. Then she saw what was on the pages in front of her, and her hands turning the eggs froze. She only came back to her senses when a drop of oil spat onto the back of her hand. She turned off the stove absent-mindedly. The agreement clutched tightly in her fist. The burn throbbed, but she paid it no attention. Stella smiled as she looked at Madison's stunned expression and handed her a pen. Sign it quickly, now, she urged her. Then your future will have nothing to do with the Greenwald family. You'll be free to do whatever you like with the Westons. Madison stood in the middle of the kitchen, trying to decide what to do. The agreement was clear and simple. I married Ian Weston against my family's wishes, and now they are disowning any responsibility for my future expenses. That's all just as I expected, she thought. But she hadn't been expecting the final clause. No matter what happened to her in the future, she was not allowed to turn to Zach for help without the unanimous agreement of the entire family. Madison understood it all too clearly. To cut ties with the rest of the Greenwald family 
she also had to sever her ties with Zack. Everyone in the world must know how much Zack dotes on me, she thought. He's never cared what my parents thought. He's been the perfect brother to me my whole life. How can they be so cruel as to ask me to give up the one decent family connection I have? She mumbled in her head. She finished reading the agreement and asked, Does Zack know about this? Stella's eyes flickered. She said with unnatural joviality, Of course he knows. This was agreed by the entire family. Madison laughed mockingly. She put the agreement to one side and poured the congealed eggs onto a plate. Lightly, she spoke. In that case, get him to bring it over for me to sign. I won't put up a fight if he tells me himself. Stella ground her teeth, but she couldn't take back the lie she had just told. She snatched up the documents and walked out. Madison could hear her beginning an angry phone conversation as her footsteps faded away. She looked down at the rapidly cooling plate of eggs in her hands and realized she no longer had an appetite. Suddenly, she really wanted to move in with Ian right away. At least that way she could escape this depressing place. Madison had just returned to her room after scraping her uneaten breakfast into the garbage disposal when Stella came in with a smug grin, still talking to someone on the phone. Madison didn't even glance at her. She finished putting the things she needed for the day into her handbag and headed for the door. I told you, unless Zack talks to me about it, I won't sign. I'm not joking, she thought. I can be stubborn when I need to be. I'll only listen to Zack because no one else in this family is worth paying attention to. As Madison stepped out of the front door, Ian's car pulled into the driveway. Her footsteps sped up as she went to meet him. Stella burst out of the door behind her. Madison, stop right there, she called, waving the agreement in the air. She chased her stepdaughter toward Ian's car. You have to sign today before you leave. Ian got out of the car and came around to open the passenger door for Madison, shooting her a quizzical look. Madison frowned. Let's get out of here quickly, she said. Stella stepped into her personal space, crowding her up against the car and preventing Ian from opening the door. Madison, she said, as she tried to get her breath back. You mustn't take advantage of us like this. You insisted on marrying Ian, and we didn't say anything against it. But we lost out on a lot because of your headstrong decision. After we've lost so much, we can't be left constantly on guard, waiting for you to come back and try to take advantage of your brother's kindness. That's not fair. So you have to sign this today, she demanded. Ian plucked the document out of Stella's hand and looked it over. Madison paled at Stella's allegations. Am I being selfish or scheming, she wondered. Even if I am, I'm not willing to sign this before I talk to Zack about it. I've never really experienced parental love. It was Zack who brought me up since he was so much older than me. She had been only five years old when Stella married into the family, and Zack was seven years older. I was so happy, she remembered. I suddenly had a mom brothers and a sister. I even thought that maybe Dad would like me more. But it was only Zack who ever looked out for me. I was always the outsider in the family. But Zack became my shield, my refuge. You can't give up the relationship that's been my safe place for all these years. Madison bit her lip as she remembered all the trials of her childhood. Don't think you can come crawling to your brother when your new husband mistreats you, Stella stated. Our family can't afford to lose face like that. Since you chose him over us, he's all you've got now. You've made your bed and you have to lie in it, she concluded. Stella spoke loudly, knowing that the neighbors would be listening for any gossip. Let them see how Madison has failed to live up to my expectations, she thought. It will only improve my reputation. Everybody knows it's hard to be a stepmom. Your brother is our family's greatest hope. Stella continued, I can't control your willfulness, but I can make sure you don't bring the whole family down with you. Madison's hands balled into fists at her side. Frowning, Ian clapped her tense hands within his larger ones. Biting her lip, Madison asked, Ian, do you think I should sign? If I sign, I've cut off all avenues of retreat. 
Just like Stella said, if my marriage ends up badly, there will be nowhere for me to turn. Even knowing the rest of my family hates me, if I just had the safety blanket of my brother's love, it would be okay. But they won't let me have that, she thought. Ian didn't understand what Madison was thinking. I've heard her version of her family history, but I've never seen it for myself, he thought. In my opinion, she's better off without them. This agreement's to her benefit as well. Even her brother, though? Yes, even Zach. I don't like how reliant she is on him. Even siblings shouldn't be that close. Ian's masculine pride reared its ugly head. Without thinking, he spoke. I think there's no reason to hesitate. Madison fell silent, looking up at Ian and trying to read the future in his eyes. Her heart warmed as she remembered that he'd promised to be there for her whenever she needed him. Ian, if I sign it, will you always protect me, no matter what happens? She asked seriously. Ian finally understood why Madison didn't want to sign. He nodded firmly. Yes, whatever you need, for as long as you need it. If I can give it to you, it's yours, he assured. She smiled tremendously, her dimples just showing. Okay, I'll sign. She took the pen from Stella's outstretched hand and quickly scrawled her signature. Stella immediately snatched the agreement and walked back to the house with a smug expression. Don't ever forget your promise, Madison said to Ian. If he forgets, then sooner or later, I'll be finished, she thought, gazing implorably into his eyes. I won't forget, Ian murmured, equally serious. Now it's time for the wedding reception. Let's show this marriage off to everyone, he grinned. Many influential people had gathered at the Griffin that day. They mingled in the large ballroom, holding glasses of champagne and gossiping about the marriage that had surprised them all. Isn't that an army general? One guest exclaimed to another. The guests at this reception are very classy. The Westons aren't sparing any costs, another said. This is the premier wedding venue in the city. There wasn't a spare seat in the hall. Everyone who had been invited turned up, as they didn't want to miss the opportunity to show off in front of the city's glitterati. Quite a few people even tried to gatecrash, but were firmly turned away at the door, after being tantalized by merely a glimpse of the lush decorations. Was Ian Weston here yet? The guests were beginning to ask. Do you even know what he looks like? Ian had always kept a low profile just focusing on his long college courses and residencies. At 27, and already considered a top surgeon, he was an enigmatic character, and there had been much speculation about him over the years. But there was even more speculation about his new bride. What's so special about this woman that she managed to scoop up the young doctor? A guest wondered aloud. This reception had been worth waiting for. Ian didn't take Madison directly to the Griffin, First, they went to a salon to fix her hair and makeup, and then to a boutique for a dress. Since I got buried in street clothes, this is essentially my wedding dress, she thought, as she chose a simple but stylish white gown. At the door of the Griffin's ballroom, she was attacked by a fit of nerves and tightened her grip on Ian's arm. Ian touched the back of her hand where it wrapped around his elbow, silently comforting her. Just before the doors opened to admit them, he said, I'm sorry there wasn't time to plan something more elaborate. I'll make sure the rest of our marriage lives up to your expectations better than this. His words helped her to relax, and she smiled up at him. You've booked the largest banquet hall in the city, and you think it's not enough? I'm flattered, Madison remarked nervously. Ian burst into laughter just as the venue's manager threw open the doors into the ballroom and stepped aside for them to enter. Ian leaned down to speak into her ear. Madison, I'll be your rock from now on. You can always lean on me. She melted against his side, her smile becoming soft. It no longer matters that I don't have any relatives here to celebrate my marriage, she thought as they walked together into the crowded room. It was tastefully decorated with swaths of white silk and bunches of white and lilac flowers. Sparkling chandeliers overhead had been hung with tiny, twinkling silver bells. It was everything Madison could have wanted. 
All the assembled guests turned toward them like flowers toward the sun and burst into applause. Most of the guests might not have known the young couple, but they made a striking first impression. Ian's understated black suit made him seem even taller and slimmer than usual. His deep, fiery eyes showed maturity and restraint. He walked into the room elegantly, Madison gliding alongside him on his arm. Her simple white satin dress showcased her smooth shoulders and shapely neck, making her appear both stylish and unpretentious. The guests couldn't take their eyes off the newlyweds, but a soft buzz of conversation arose in their wake. There's Madison Greenwald, someone whispered. But where's the rest of the Greenwald family? Another one asked. I don't think they're here. This marriage has caused quite a stir, someone spoke. Madison heard the whispers as she passed. They didn't surprise her, but then the whispers were silenced by the arrival of Diana Weston, powering through the crowd to greet them. She wore a violently purple dress and an expression of satisfaction that shocked the crowd into silence. Diana, who had a reputation for being exceptionally difficult to please, was actually happy with Madison. Edward and Olivia followed in Diana's wake, coming to greet their new daughter-in-law with smiles. When Madison saw the members of the Weston clan walking toward her, her smile grew even warmer. These are what really classy people look like, she thought with a sigh. They're so superior in attitude compared to my family. Looking at Diana, Ian's parents, and his brother Daniel, whom she had yet to meet, she got into thinking, this is the sort of elegance and charm that a woman like Stella can only aspire to. This is true nobility, the class that has been ingrained for generations, not new money pretentiousness like my family. Stella would go mad with jealousy if she could see me now. She held out her hands to greet them. Grandma, she said sweetly, kissing the old lady on the cheek. As Edward and Olivia approached her, she greeted them as mom and dad. I mustn't do anything to embarrass Ian or his family. They've been so kind to me. I'm all on my own to make a good impression, Madison thought. Diana looked very pleased with the impression Madison had made with her grand entrance. She was smiling so widely that her eyes had almost disappeared into a nest of wrinkles. She shot a laser glance at some of the women in the crowd, the ones who had been gossiping as Madison walked past, and they cringed away, chastened. You're a good girl, Madison, she said. That's what our boy needs. Will your family be arriving? Madison couldn't help flinching slightly. Diana noticed her reaction and patted her hand sympathetically. But Ian interjected to say, They'll be here shortly. They encountered some problems and have been delayed on the way. Madison whipped her head around to stare at him. Why would he say that? He knows they're not going to show up to a party organized by the Westons, who they think are beneath them. Although I bet they'll regret it when they hear the party was held in the Griffin's ballroom. She wondered in disbelief. Diana smiled happily and took Madison by the arm, leading her around the room and introducing her to a whole parade of equally elderly women who all pinched Madison's cheeks and praised her beauty. Your grandson has great taste. What a pretty granddaughter-in-law you have, one of them remarked. She's very beautiful. So few young women know how to present themselves without being vulgar, another one stated. Compliments flew. I'm sure none of them are thrilled about my background, but at least my personality has passed muster. All these old money families would be too polite to directly insult me, of course, but they wouldn't even talk to me if they thought I was not up to the mark, Madison thought, and grinned in her heart. Listening to Diana's conversations with her friends, Madison got the impression that her family's exploits were often the focus of gossip especially Stella's marriage to John, after she had already born one of his children out of wedlock. But they were all being very careful to be polite about the Greenwald, now a fear of insulting the Westons. My new family is obviously highly regarded. This is the sort of thing my dad's always been seeking, but he's never achieved it, because he thinks he can buy respect. The Westons have earned that respect over generations. 
The fact they are stupendously wealthy doesn't factor in, Madison realized. She let Diana tow her around the entire venue, but eventually they made it back to Ian's side. Seizing the opportunity, she leaned in close to him and asked, Are my parents really coming? No matter how they've treated me, I'd still like them to be here. Seeing this might make them view me in a better light, she thought. Ian lowered his head and looked at Madison. Her eyes were full of expectation. They won't come, he replied softly. She couldn't help her disappointment. I'm Dad's eldest daughter, but he treats me like a stranger, she thought. Not wanting to stop hoping, she asked, Then who will be coming? When Ian saw the hope in Madison's eyes being shattered bit by bit, his heart ached. Your brother Zach will come and witness your wedding, he replied. A charming smile spread across her face. She thought about trying to get a hold of him to ask him to be here. But then, with all that mess over the agreement, I never did. But this is perfect. You will be here, and the rest of my awful family won't, she thought. Madison quickly sorted out her emotions and smiled sweetly at everyone. Madison, hello! A woman she knew vaguely came and greeted her enthusiastically. Racking her brains, Madison remembered her name was Sandra Bright and chatted politely with her. I don't see anyone from your family here, Sandra said, glancing around casually. Although she was surprised by her bluntness, Madison answered, No, they haven't arrived yet. Sandra, who hadn't intended to be rude, saw that everyone around them was listening avidly to their conversation. Embarrassed, she said quietly, I'm sorry. Madison smiled at her. Don't worry about it, it's not a big deal. After all, I'm the one getting married, not my family. Sandra looked at Madison with an expression she couldn't read. They made some more polite conversation. But by the time the two women parted, the news that the Greenwald family wasn't in attendance had spread throughout the room. Rumors flew that no one from the family would turn up at all. As the gossip spread, the event planner tapped a microphone on the raised platform at the front of the hall and announced, Please take your seat. The dinner will begin after the speeches. Ian led Madison onto the stage as all the guests found their places around the large, round banqueting table. Looking up at the young couple on the dais, everyone was impressed by what a beautiful pair they made. Ian cleared his throat. Thank you for coming, everyone. I know this was all arranged at the last minute. I hope it didn't mess up anyone's plans. His deep voice was charming, and he was very polite. I'm so pleased you could attend this reception for my wedding to Madison Greenwald. He paused to wait for the applause to die down. But this rushed affair isn't the lavish event my wife deserves. I would like to announce that we'll hold a proper wedding celebration in three weeks, the weekend after Madison graduates. I hope you will all honor us by attending. It will be a whole day event, with activities in the afternoon before the dinner. This is my first gift to my new bride, Ian announced with a grin. As soon as he finished speaking, the room erupted in excited whispers. Everyone knew the extent of the Weston holdings. They had subsidiaries all over the country. A day of activities at the Weston was bound to be a lavish affair indeed. Madison may have previously been tarred by her family's bad reputation, but this made her rise in everyone's estimation. The last time the Westons had arranged such a large-scale event had been for Edward and Olivia's wedding. On that day, the entire Weston business empire had also celebrated, with all their one million employees nationwide raising a glass to their boss. At the wedding reception, Edward had made a promise that, when he retired, he would take Olivia on a tour of all the places where there was a Weston subsidiary office. In the years since then, the company had expanded worldwide, focusing especially on the tourism industry, as if Edward was ensuring that there were as many beautiful places as possible for him to take his wife. Everyone had benefited from Edward's promise, as the rapid growth of both foreign and domestic tourism had brought a knock-on effect for other local businesses. So now, the thought uppermost in everyone's mind was what surprises might be in store for them at the celebration of Ian's wedding. All the guests looked at Madison with new eyes. 
such lavish plans meant that she was important to the Westons, and her status in the family couldn't be underestimated. There were no more disdainful looks cast her way after that announcement. Everyone seemed to have forgotten that they had judged her for her parents' absence. Madison was just beginning to think she could relax when a young woman spoke up. It certainly seems that the Westons dote on Madison, nearly as much as her brother Zach used to dote on her. She made her words sound polite, but they were designed to wound. I've heard that Zach's back in the country. I do wonder if he'll be coming today. These words stirred the crowd up again. Everyone knew how Zach doted on Madison, so there could be no reason for him to boycott the wedding. There was silence as everyone waited for Madison's reply. If no one from her family came today, she would be humiliated and, more than that, it would cause embarrassment to her new family. There were lots of families present who would have loved to marry one of their daughters into the Western clan, and they couldn't help but feel some anticipation at the thought that Ian could make a mistake choosing Madison. Standing awkwardly on the stage, Madison opened her mouth and stammered, I... I'm so sorry, my family... Ian caught her around the waist in a firm grip, and she stopped abruptly. The doors at the back of the hall swung open, and the sound of a familiar voice brought her instant relief. I'm so sorry I'm late, Zach called out as he entered the ballroom. Although he was alone, his dignified presence commanded the attention of the whole room, and the entire atmosphere changed. He strode across the hall and joined his sister on the stage. Kissing her on the cheek, he said, You look stunning, sis. I wish I'd been there to give you away at your wedding. But let's imagine I'm doing it right now, all right? It would make me so proud to hand you over into Ian's capable arms. Tears welled up in her eyes, and she could only nod helplessly. Look after her, all right? Give her the space she needs. Never let her drift too far away. Zach turned to Ian and said quietly, Ian narrowed his eyes. Of course. She's my wife, he replied. Zach went to greet the rest of Ian's family. Madison sagged. Thank goodness he's here. Now it doesn't matter at all that no one else from my family came. No one can say anything bad about us. But at the same time, it hurts so much to know that I can never rely on him for protection again. That's the choice I made, she thought. Suppressing the urge to cry, she turned around. You're all I've got now. My family has cut me off, and I'm not allowed to turn to my brother for help. You have to. You must protect me, she whispered softly to Ian. That's the bitter truth. Even though Zach came through for me today, I can never let myself rely on him again, she thought powerlessly. Zach's presence made the rest of the reception flow like a dream. He smoothed things over and thoroughly charmed the Westons, so that no one even noticed the absence of Madison's parents. All the guests were left with the impression that Zach was the Greenwald who was worth knowing. In the future, Madison might be added to that list. After the dessert of delicate lemon mousse was served, the guests began to drift away talking amongst themselves about what a lovely evening they'd had and the marvelous food. Madison, exhausted, let out a sigh of relief as the guests departed, although it was with a pang that she hugged Zach goodbye. Diana was worn out and retired early, and soon only the couple and Ian's brother and parents remained. We're going to go home now. You look tired, too. You're welcome to stay with us tonight if you like. In fact... You can stay with us until you and Ian find a house together, Olivia said to Madison. Madison felt a rush of relief and gratitude. Nothing would give me more pleasure than getting out from under Dad's roof, she thought. Now I really feel like my marriage is real. Until now, it's just been a piece of paper that seemed too flimsy to protect me. Tonight, the weight had lifted. She smiled at her mother-in-law and replied politely, Thank you. I'd love that. Daniel left with his parents, and then it was just the two of them in the massive empty ballroom, the flower arrangements beginning to droop. The manager hurried over to Ian and said in a low voice, 
Sorry, sir, but Luke Morris and Kelsey Greenwald are asking to see you. Madison's grip on Ian's hand tightened, and her smile froze. It's up to you. What do you want to do? Ian asked, looking at Madison. I know he doesn't care if his identity is discovered, but I don't want Kelsey to know about this. She'll ruin this feeling if she gets her grubby little hands on my happiness, she thought through. She looked up at his kind face. I don't want to see them, she replied. Ian stood up and held out his arms. She threaded her arm through his, and the staff led them toward the back entrance of the hall. Luke and Kelsey burst into the ballroom, just as the couple was making their escape. They had rushed over when they had, belatedly, gotten the news of the reception held by the youngest son of the Westons, as Luke wanted to find an excuse to develop business ties with the Weston family. Seeing Ian retreating, Luke called out, Mr. Weston! He dragged Kelsey with him as he charged across the floor. She tottered on her stiletto heels, nearly spraining her ankle. As she ran, she tried to identify the woman at the groom's side. She looks vaguely familiar. How many people could I identify just from seeing their back? Kelsey thought. Ian heard Luke calling him, but he didn't stop. Halfway across the room, the manager intercepted Luke and stopped him in his tracks like an especially classy bow-tie bouncer. Luke tried again to get Ian's attention, calling over the manager's shoulder. Hello, Mr. Weston. I'm Luke Morris, the manager of Morris Corp. It was humiliating talking to Ian's back, but he plowed on. Morris Corporation would like to discuss some business collaborations. Ian didn't reply. He just snorted loudly, and his bride chuckled. But Luke and Kelsey still couldn't see who she was. Madison almost stopped and turned around so that she could scoff at Luke to his face. It's not that Morris Corp isn't a good company, but that it isn't enough to justify his arrogance. No other business manager in the city, no, in the entire country, would think to approach the Westons like this, especially at a wedding reception, she thought. They reached the back door and stepped out, leaving Luke and Kelsey fuming behind them. He was mocking me, and I can't even say anything because I need to stay on the Westons' good side. Damn this jumped-up penguin of a griffin manager for getting in my way, Luke thought furiously. Kelsey, on the other hand, only had eyes for the woman on Ian's arm. She looks familiar. I'm sure she's someone I've seen before, but where? I just need a glimpse of her face, she thought. But the door closed behind the happy couple, and she was left to stew in her frustration. The following morning, the society pages of all the local papers were filled with details of Ian Weston's wedding reception. Reporters hadn't been allowed to take any photos, but they had painted such a vivid picture with their words that many young women sighed over their breakfast, wishing that it had been them who had married into the Weston family. Madison stayed for a few days at Edward and Olivia's, loving every moment. Living here is like staying in a hotel. I can get up and go to bed whenever I want. I can make myself food without hassle. And best of all, people seem to like me, she thought. Eventually, however, she returned to the Greenwald. All her textbooks and study materials were there, and she needed to focus on her thesis defense, which was coming up soon. The house was quiet. Due to Kelsey's wedding preparations, everyone was out from early in the morning to late at night. This morning, the sun was shining, making the whole world glow cheerfully, and Madison was sitting at her desk near the window, putting the finishing touches to her final design project. The video project, an advertisement, needed only a few tweaks. She was busily switching back and forth between windows, comparing her final draft with her many earlier attempts, when there was a knock on her bedroom door. She jumped up to open it, and frowned at the people invading her private space. Why are you here? Kelsey smirked as she pulled Luke into the room by the hand. Her voice was laced with a sickly sweetness as she asked, are you still working on your advertisement? Madison's good mood immediately fled. Whatever you came here to say, just spit it out. I can't imagine she's here to ask me about the progress of my project, she thought wryly. 
Kelsey walked to Madison's small office desk and swept her gaze across her computer screen. Ducking her head, she smiled. Darting an embarrassed glance at Luke, she said, I thought you should know that we've set a date for the wedding. I'm here to give you your invitation. Madison's expression didn't change. She simply raised her eyebrows. Great, you can leave as soon as you've handed it over. Her indifference made Kelsey scowl. I've always hated how Madison can steal the spotlight by doing the right thing. She always wins. I should have been the eldest, not her. Well, she doesn't get to win this time, she thought. Look, I'm marrying Luke. I'll be Luke Morris's wife. The one and only Mrs. Morris. She stepped into Madison's personal space, desperate to provoke a reaction. You won't blame me for making a good marriage, will you, sis? Don't resent me for knowing how to pin down a good thing as soon as possible, Kelsey asserted. Looking straight into her eyes, Madison shrugged. Get married. I have no objections at all. Don't be like this, Mad, Luke said soothingly. Kelsey was only concerned that you'd be uncomfortable if you heard this from someone else. So we came over as soon as the invitations were printed, Luke pinched in. Madison's been so antagonistic toward Kelsey lately. It's too much. I picked the right sister, and she has to accept it, he thought and frowned. Mads, Kelsey is being very generous, thinking of your feelings. Don't keep giving her the cold shoulder, Luke objected. Madison almost laughed out loud. She sat in her desk chair and leaned back, cool and collected. Looking up at the couple in front of her, she said, are you trying to assuage your feelings of guilt, Luke? You don't need to bother. People who don't know what you've done will assume the breakup was my fault. I don't care anymore, she continued. If you want to marry Kelsey, go ahead. It's got nothing to do with me. I'm married to Ian now. We don't need to have anything more to do with each other. I'll never ask you for anything again, and you can be damn sure you won't get any help from me. Give me the invitation. Whether I come will depend on whether I have anything better to do that day. Now I'm busy. You can see yourself out. Madison concluded. Their faces stiffened. Madison had drawn a clear line in the sand, and no one wanted to be on the wrong side of it. We're sisters, Kelsey began, but the look in Madison's eyes made her words dry up. I know not to mess with Madison when she's angry, she thought, as she pulled the Luke out of the room. She took one last look at her sister, hatred burning in her eyes. It's always Madison's fault. It's my mother who's head of our family, so I should have pride of life. But Madison's older than me, and Zach has always given her preferential treatment, even though she's so uncultured, and she pays no attention to her appearance. But people still turn to look whenever she enters the room. It's not fair. I hate her. If it wasn't for her... I'd be the only princess in the family, Kelsey thought viciously. I'll snatch everything she has. Then everyone will see who rules the Greenwald family. Kelsey mumbled in her head. Clenching her fist, she gave her a last glance. Madison closed the door in Kelsey's face and immediately put them from her mind. She had a design to finish. Three days later, the day of Madison's thesis defense finally arrived. She rose early and applied subtle makeup, dressing in a white pantsuit and low heels. She tied her unruly hair back and examined her reflection. We reckon I look suitably intellectual, she decided. Just as she finished getting ready, Zach knocked on the door. She went out and gave him a sweet smile, flashing her dimples. Good morning. He smiled in return and handed her a latte as they got into his car. Glancing at her as she sat in the passenger seat, sipping her drink, he asked, Are you ready? She nodded, but didn't reply because her phone was ringing. It was Allie, but they were already nearly at the college campus, so Madison put her phone away. Thanks, Zach, Madison said as she threw open the door and jumped out, rushing off up the path to the design school. Zach shook his head helplessly, then called his best friend, who had the great good fortune to now be able to call an in-law. 
Madison was out of breath by the time she got to the dissertation room of the advertising and design department. Allie hurried over her to greet her, but was pulled up short by a burst of mocking laughter. Madison turned with a frown. Of course, she thought, it would be Kate King, not one of the nicest girls in my course. Kate was wearing a bright red tunic dress over a white t-shirt. Her cronies, Meg Smith and Leah Jensen, were here with her. They were also dressed in flashy, fashionable clothes, and were all trying to mask the aura of slightly panicked desperation that characterized most students preparing for their oral presentations. Look who it is, Kate said, looking at Madison with her arms crossed and chin raised. Heard that you married a doctor from Mercy Hospital. Madison smiled, but her frostiness was obvious to everyone. I'm flattered that you're so interested in my affairs, Madison replied. Kate snorted and glanced sideways at Meg. The smile on her face carried a trace of ridicule. Leah and Meg were staring at Madison as if they would like to dissect her and examine her under a microscope. Allie's brows drew down and she began to pop up like a pressure cooker ready to blow. Madison grabbed her hand and squeezed, giving her head a subtle shake to tell Allie not to raise to the provocation. Why are you all so quiet and nervous today? Jason Wright said, jogging up to the group with a basketball under his arm. Meg blushed and stepped sideways so that she was partially hidden behind Kate. Jason was flushed from exercise and youthful vigor, he looked happy to see Madison, and he said to her, Hi, you haven't been in class for ages. I've been a bit busy, she replied with a smile. Jason's cheerful expression fell a bit. Yes, I know. Who doesn't? She's been busy getting hitched and trying to prove her innocence, he thought. He felt tongue-tied in her presence, so he turned to the other young women and asked, What are you all doing here? Kate and Meg exchanged a look that carried out an entire silent conversation. Looking at Madison with a proud, sly smile, Kate said, Madison, I'm looking forward to seeing if Jason's protection helps you today. She linked arms with Meg and Leah, and the three went into the lecture hall. What was that about? Madison asked. I don't know, Allie said nervously, but something's up. I've been trying to get a hold of you to let you know that you and Meg are both presenting perfume ads today. Madison looked at her in surprise. No wonder Allie looks so frazzled, she thought. This isn't a good problem to encounter on my final exam. Are you sure? Is she doing women's perfume or men's? Allie pursed her lips and said helplessly, I haven't seen her project, but that's what I heard. So I thought you should know that you have the same theme. Madison let out a big breath, her cheeks bulging. Allie gave her a comforting hug. Don't worry. Even if you have the same theme, I'm sure your ads will be very different. This sort of thing happens all the time. You'll just have to give a clear oral presentation, and you've got nothing to worry about. Madison nodded. I do hope everything goes smoothly today, she thought. They went into the lecture hall, where the oral defense was to take place. The five of them were scheduled to present this morning, and they sat in a row behind the three professors, waiting for their turn. Each student had to show their final project and make a PowerPoint presentation to support their work. Allie was the first to be called to the stage. She had made an ad about lipstick that was both charming and sexy. It was undoubtedly effective. Allie did a good job explaining her design choices and each of the professors asked her a question about her methodology. Allie answered without hesitation, and then flopped back into her seat beside Madison with a sigh of relief. Meg was up next. When the lights in the room dimmed and her ad began to play on the screen, Madison's face paled. Allie turned to look at her in disbelief. There are too many similarities to my project. I knew we were covering the same topic, but I didn't expect this much overlap, Madison thought in horror. As the video continued to play, her panic changed to anger. This isn't just similar, this is my ad, she realized. The video started in a sun-drenched bathroom, the air filled with colorful foam. A blonde, blue-eyed beauty stepped out of the bathtub, wrapped in a white bathrobe. 
When she stretched up into the warm sunshine, the rope loosened a little, exposing a butterfly tattoo on her shoulder blade. The beautiful woman accidentally knocked over a pink perfume bottle on the counter, and the fresh, elegant scent wafted out. The colorful bubbles danced with a light of their own, and the butterfly tattoo flapped its wings and lifted off the woman's shoulder. As the butterfly flew toward the camera, the background blurred out until you could only see the woman smiling playfully at the camera, the other half of the screen taken up by the bright-winged butterfly. The video was full of charm and vitality. Finally, words scrolled onto the bottom of the screen. Your perfume, the scent of his body. The lights in the room came up. Madison glared at Meg and saw the complacency on her face. The assessors were discussing the advert among themselves, full of praise. Madison's hands had been clenched into fists since the video began playing. By now, her fingertips had gone white. I can't believe it, she thought. This cannot be a coincidence. Meg began her PowerPoint presentation. Hello, professors and classmates. I would like to tell you about my process for producing this perfume advert. She clicked on the next slide. Madison couldn't contain her rage anymore. Leaping to her feet, she roared, Meg Smith stole my project. The classroom went silent. You could have heard a pin drop. Allie was also glaring at Meg, but one of the professors turned around in his seat and said, Madison, this is Meg's plot for her oral defense. If you have questions or concerns, you can voice them later. You have to make a scene here. Madison's professors weren't fond of her. She had been taking on paid advertising work since the previous year, and had already developed a bit of a reputation for herself. Because of that, some rumors had been circulated that she had already used her beauty to advance her career, causing many of her teachers to develop a bad impression of her. Although Madison had proven her innocence in front of the media, once the view had taken root in someone's mind, it was hard to uproot. Even if they could see intellectually that they were wrong, it wasn't easy to change ingrained dislike. I know I'm in a bad situation here, and all these factors are against me. But if I let this go now, Meg will crucify me when it's my turn to present. It will be worse if I wait. And I've worked so hard. I'm not willing to let someone else take credit for my work, she thought. She tried her best to suppress the anger in her heart. After glaring fiercely at Meg, she looked at the three teachers in the front row and said firmly, The work Meg has just presented is mine. I don't know how she got her hands on it, but it is not hers. All I know is that I made that advertisement. Thank you for listening. Please don't forget subscribe. See you on the next episodes.